Thank you all for coming to the August 10th, 2021 meeting of the Ohio City Council. Uh, welcome all and thanks to James Hahn in particular for setting all this up and staff for making this happen in Libby Bowl. And just a reminder, um, if you could refrain from yelling or <laughs> clapping, we can use jazz hands if you agree. Uh, I know the bowl is a little conducive to um, public expressions of uh, emotion, but if we can just uh, keep that down. Um, so I'd really appreciate that. Uh, would you lead us in the pledge, please, Randy? Yeah. Your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God. Uh, make sure your fan isn't pointed at the microphone. That might be your fan. Was that me? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Randy. And may we have approval of the agenda? Move to approve. I'll second. Okay, great. Uh, may we have a vote on that, please, Gail? Council Member Blatz. Uh, if we're live, consensus is fine. We don't need a roll call vote on every item. Okay. I don't think it's you said even changing. Okay, thank you. Consent items, but we don't have to. Um, if we're live, we don't have to all vote. It can just be like all in favor say aye. Okay. Thank you. Um, aye. 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 Uh, no presentations. Any commission reports, James? Gail, did we have any commission reports today? No commission reports. Okay, thank you. I will move on to public communication. Um, so these we're going to start with just a general communications items not on, the agenda. on items not on the agenda. So let's begin with Wendy Larner. Good evening. Again, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, forgive me for seemingly kicking a dead dog, but I'm going to speak on the ATP um, project. I do think we ought to reestablish a local control over that. If we want bike lanes on Maricopa Highway, then let's decide in Ojai how we want them. Caltrans may have jurisdiction over those, but they have seemingly given local communities the opportunity to submit plans that they desire. And unless that's a, a ruse, then I presume they really want to hear what we want. So this is not China, thank God. In Ojai and across the USA, cycling is primarily a recreation. Um, Let's not congest Maricopa Highway with crazy, confusing designs like short bi-directional bike lanes and impeding emergency vehicles, trucks, and uh, all traffic by narrowing the road. You have approved the plan before the demonstra demonstration project is truly relevant because the high school obviously hasn't been open and we've been under COVID restrictions. So all of these counts and, and stats that have been put out to say this is acceptable don't are really not relevant to what's really gonna happen when everything is opened up. Pedestrian cross lights as have been provided at Carrillo and Maricopa Highway are great safety features. It would be, be prudent to add them to all critical highway crossings in Ojai. However, curb extensions will only increase danger as they force cyclists to turn out toward traffic to pedal around them. Even on less traveled Ojai streets, curb extensions have proved undesirable. They were tried several years ago at North Montgomery and Aliso and were sum summarily removed shortly after installation. The ones currently on Country Club Drive by the Ojai Valley in entrance are routinely clipped. After the initial installation, they have had to be shortened, lights were added, signs, reflectors, and different paint colors 
have not alleviated the problem. In, respon in response to pointing this out to the Public Works Department, I was told Ojai drivers just have to get used to proceeding more cautiously. Unfortunately, the majority of cars using that entrance and exit are visitors to Ojai. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, two more public communications. Ron Solar Solarzano, please correct me. Um, and then Deborah Moe. All righty. Thank you all members of council. My name is Ron uh, Solarzano and I am the regional librarian for the Ojai Valley. Uh, tonight, I wanted to provide you with a general update on the operations of the Ojai Library. Uh, to begin with, as of June 15th, the Ojai Library has been fully open to the public and has resumed its normal hours of operation, which are Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., and Friday through Sunday, 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Our library continues to comply with all state and county guidelines relating to COVID safety. This means that, among other things, Face coverings are required for unvaccinated individuals who are visiting us and are strongly recommended for all persons, regardless of vaccination status while indoors. Our building and collection are fully accessible for browsing and customers can request items online using our catalog as normal. In addition, some programs are returning to the Ojai Library, including our ukulele club, which meets on Mondays at 10 a.m. and our knitting and fiber arts clubs uh, for both children and adults, which meet on Sundays at 2 and 3.30 p.m. We're even offering our annual summer reading challenges for children and adults, which you can register for online and participate in through August 22nd. Since the pandemic began, our youth librarians throughout the county have been offering virtual story times through our YouTube and Facebook pages and have designed and distributed take-home activity kits for children that are still available at the library. We've also been providing online homework assistance for students and virtual programming for adults. Many of these remote offerings continue to be available even as our libraries have opened their doors again. The library has also rolled out a number of other great programs relating to our new library of things, including do-it-yourself home energy kits and computer kits that include a laptop and Wi-Fi hotspot. You can learn more about these kits and our virtual offerings by contacting our library or visiting our website at www.bencolibrary.org. The last year and a half has been a challenging time for all of us, and more than anything, I want to communicate to you, uh, to you all that your library is and will continue to be available to you. If you have any questions about our library programs, collections, or services, please do not hesitate to reach out to me, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, Mary Six, I have a quick question for Ron, if that's all right. Ron, are your interior courtyard and meeting areas open for uh, uh, rental use again by groups? Uh, the courtyard in the back is available for general use. Uh, we don't typically reserve that space, so it's just free to use. And then the meeting room out behind the library is available for rental. Uh, if anyone is interested, they can contact the library and Everything's ask for open. me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, next, we have Deborah Moe. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad that the library is open. I want to start off by saying um, thank you, Mr. Wyrick, for continuing your support of our uh, water lawsuit. Um, but I am here to talk about senior affordable housing. I have worked in the senior community in this town for about 33 years and uh, over the last year and a half um, several of our local seniors have been displaced due to rental costs uh, i'm starting to get involved with a company called icon that does 3d printing houses it is phenomenal they have just built a little village in austin texas for homeless uh the houses are 400 square feet they have a bedroom a kitchen a bathroom and a living room and they have a huge front porch 
I think it's really, really important. And I don't mean when I say senior housing, affordable senior housing, I don't mean a rest home, assisted living. I mean, seniors that have retired that didn't end up being homeowners or um, well off. And that's where our town has gone to. Um, unaffordable rents, people being displaced that grew up here, have been here their whole life. And I think it's a, an issue that needs to be addressed. I know the ADUs and the tiny houses are on the agenda, uh, which are all well and fine, but this is what I want to talk about. Also, I want to say that our streets are just awful. I've seen kids fall off bikes, skateboards go down. I think they really, really, really need serious attention. I know that Maricopa Highway is getting a improvement uh, all the way to, um, I can't think, <laughs> way up there. But um, yeah, anyway, the senior housing is what is really uh, important to me. And I'd like to see something get started on that because I know several seniors that are about to be displaced as well, that um, their social security didn't turn Time. into... Thank you for listening, and I'm sure I'm glad everybody's back. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, oh, yeah, there are two two buzzards, two bells. Oh, okay. Oh, two microphones. Yes. Uh, Gail, any public communications on Zoom? None. Okay, great. All right, uh, we will move on to the consent calendar. A motion to approve everything. Um, Move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Hey, mate, we have a roll call here. We don't need a roll call. A uh, roll call is not required. Okay. Uh, all right. All in favor, all opposed is sufficient. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, wonderful. All right, we will move on to the public hearing now. The public hearing is now open. Uh, we'll begin with a uh, Number two, designation of the Hummel House and the surrounding property at the uh, City of Ohio. It will be the his City of Ohio Historic Landmark number 29, located at 1105 Signal Street. Um, James, any staff report? Yeah, just a brief staff report. Uh, Lucas Seibert, our newly uh, appointed Community Development Director, will be giving the um, staff report for uh, a brief staff report for this item. Excuse me. Is there no um, uh, public comments on the different items on the agenda, be on the consent calendar? Because it was my intention to ask that a few of those items be postponed on the agenda, and, on the agenda, and I neglected to do that. But is it possible to speak on those items? Well, nothing was pulled from the agenda. The certainly any member of the public may comment on any item on consent. I understand the comment cards have a box to check for that. Yes. So and I did, but the consent calendar has already been passed, and now you're moving on where there's going to be comments on other items. There's something in your blue cards. So if the comment card, if, if your comment card did have that checked, then we apologize for missing that. And my recommendation to the council would be to take your comments now. If and if any member of the council wishes to revisit, that could be done. If the council wished, of course, it's their choice. Okay, you want to go ahead, Wendy? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was um, wanting to ask, ask some questions about 1L. Um, it's my understanding that this eliminates R1 zoning. No, it Is that does a not. correct assumption? Not at all, no. In the chart, it said all R zones. And so in all those R zones, it sounded like, and this is just trying to interpret well, I'm not that familiar with that uh, many single family homes could have ADUs and a guest house. Is that correct? So 
the rule is as set by state law, not the city council. All single family residential zones can have the main house, the single family house, and an ADU under various rules and regulations, and a junior accessory dwelling unit, a JADU, also under various rules and regulations. Okay, that was my understanding. But that the key there, I'll note, if I may, is that that is set by state law. The council in this uh, the item L is proposing to extend the availability for a window to allow an ADU built without permits to be legalized if safe and meeting certain requirements. But the underlying reality that a single family zoned residents may have an ADU and a JDU has already been the law for several years and was set by state law. What was the purpose of our letter regard to the state regarding SB9? So SB9 is not on item, not germane directly to item L, the ADU ordinance. But it was about ADUs and it was about because of our unique the unique nature and everything because SB9 has the um, provision that I don't know if it's passed. I tried to find Not out yet. if it has passed yet, but is the provision still in it where eight units can be built in an R1 on an R1 lot? So very briefly, I will note for the council and public, SB9 is still pending that Senate Bill 9, which would, among other things, it would allow six units uh, on an existing um, single family lot by allowing lot splits under various rules and regulations uh, in any, not any, most single family residential zones could be one lot split into two, then a main house, then an ADU, then a JADU each. So what's now three allowed becomes six allowed if you maxed it out with ADU and JADU and had the land to do so. And that bill is still pending. And split the lot. It would require a lot split. And it only applies, it, it allows the city, or rather forces the city to require uh, a, a approval of a lot split should the owner so ask for it and various conditions be met. It has not yet passed the legislature. It's pending in the uh, assembly and uh, I don't have a crystal ball, so I'm not sure if it will pass or not. And uh, although the, the scuttlebutt, if you read Sacramento Bee and similar newspapers, is it will pass. And then it will be up to the governor to sign, which will be his choice. When oh, no, we're going to be apprising the planning commission and council. If SB9 passes, we'll be apprising the planning commission and council on some options the to deal with it. give up their control over zoning? Have they never had control over zoning in their own city? The, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say these, <clears throat> this is not on the agenda. This, oh. this is, we, we're not really, I think it might be best and I'll, I'll defer to the mayor, but to have these questions maybe presented to the city manager uh, via email or something, and then we can maybe get you a more appropriate response that would Good hopefully idea. better answer it than we can right now. Thank you, Ryan. Can we take care of that, James? Okay, um, and we do have one more um, comment from the consent calendar. So do you wanna, Brian Akins, do you wanna make that comment right now? Then we'll get to you, Lucas. So multiple hats tonight, uh, first hat museum hat, since I'm trying to put everything in three minutes. Uh, public comments museum on July 9th, the museum held a wonderful event. It was more a, uh, rather than a fundraiser, a friend raiser, we were looking for more members and younger members. We held a concert with the expanders and Jamie Drake in the back of our property, who knew that you could put 250 chairs back there. So we had that with uh, food provided by La Fuente and had about 241 people that showed up that night. So it was a wonderful event. Uh, on the other hat for item number 1H, I would like to thank the council for uh, getting our commission filled. Uh, last time we had actually had a commission filled, uh, Lucas will remember this because I was flying home from Atlanta trying to make the meeting and it was Lucas's first meeting. Uh, I got to the Y actually from Atlanta and almost made that meeting. But again, now, thanks tonight to the consent item, we now have a full commission. Thank you, Councilman Haney and Councilman Blatz for uh, recommending myself and Valerie to fill that. So thank you for that. Um, those are the two things that I had under that item. I'll be back. Thank you, Brian. All right, Lucas, we're ready for you. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Lucas Seibert, Community Development Director here with the City of Ojai. The item before the Council for consideration tonight is the Ojai Historic Landmark number 20, 29 located at, at 1105 North Signal Street. Uh, the site is designated as the Hummel House. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission on June 10th recommended on a 5-0 vote uh, approval to City Council for, for consideration as a historic landmark. Uh, the historic report, which was prepared by Post Hazleton, um, identifies this really kind of wonderful architectural representation of a mid-century modern and California ranch style home um, as being designated or recommended for de designation. Keeping this brief, within the objects of record, there is reference to hand-painted Japanese style murals by Robert Cowder. What's interesting about that is there's a, a lot of information in regards to the, to the um, record, the objects of record. This is an interesting note simply because uh, the fact that every design element for this home remains mostly intact, keeping within the Fred Hummel mid-century modern theme. Truly a true representation or a testimony to the owners before them and the current owner now, which now has identified this as a, and is recommending historic designation. So with that, staff recommends approval um, based on the attached resolution, which is attachment A to, to the staff report. All right, thank you, Lucas. Any questions from council? Gail, any public comments on this? Yes, let me pull it up. Thank you. We have, Tiffany Rochelle for agenda item two. Tiffany, if you're there, you should be able to speak. If you're muted, please unmute yourself. Hi, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Oh, so I'm actually the current homeowner and I just wanted to be available. If, I'm not exactly sure how this works, but I just wanted to be available and hear if anyone had any questions for me. Great, thank you, Tiffany. All right, uh, discussion? Discussion? Um, Randy? Yeah, the only, um, 1105, this house rings a bell. Didn't we have a discussion about this a couple of years ago about a wall going in? Yes. And uh, wasn't there some Native American artifacts that uh, had been historically, historically known? And are they a part of this study? Are they, um, Lucas, are they uh, um, a part of the, are the grounds and that immediate area a part of what's being, um, and what's the right word, historicized? <laughs> so the- Landmark, thank you. That's right. right, so not only is the home being recommended for designation, but the site is as well. So yes. Okay. And when we do something like that, um, or is there anything for the Native American to sign off on or is there anything that uh, uh, receives any form of blessing from them not formally okay all right so i have now anyone else i'm ready to make a motion if there's no other comments i was at the um his um the historic preservation commission meeting when this was discussed and I'm familiar with the house, and I'm thrilled that this is going to be um, designated, um, receive historical designation. It's completely appropriate. So, and thank you, Craig Walker, for your letter, bringing out um, the historic significance of this house. So, I will second so, that. Okay. Uh, roll call, please, Gail. Mayor Pro Tem Wyrick. Yes. Mayor Stix. Yes. Council Member Haney. Yes. Council Member Francina. Yes. Council Member Blatz. Yes. Great. And thank you, Lucas, for your work on that. Such a beautiful house. Thank you, Tiffany, for preserving it. Um, the juxtaposition of all the materials. So thank you. Stunning. So thank you. Can I just interject? Uh, I submitted a speaker's card for item number two. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Brian. 
Um, so again, I'm just here as the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, Tiffany, who was, I was looking around her when, and then I didn't realize she was on Zoom. She, uh, they gave tours to each of the commissioners. I was uh, fortunate to go with Jenny Prebor. She was our newest commissioner. Uh, Tiffany took us through the house, uh, as was uh, emphasized, much of what was put in that place when it was originally built still exists in a fine fashion. So it was wonderful. Also, as re what was referred to as uh, another story that, yes, this house a number of years ago was put forth as with a request that it be torn down to the ground because it had no historical value left. Uh, fortunately, it did, and we saw that in our tour. The other question that was raised, were there any items that were uh, from the local Chumash people? That property is the one that caused all of the work that took place in putting in place uh, the uh, municipal code talking about uh, Native American items and what needed to take place prior to doing any work, while any work is taking place, and after any work. So again, it was groundbreaking, not to use that term, bad term, what was set of precedents for, for what's going to happen in the future. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Brian. That's great news. Uh, all right, we'll move on to item number three. Uh, consider introduction of an ordinance to create a two-year pilot program for inclusion of movable tiny house regulations into the accessory dwelling unit section of the Ojai Municipal Code. So we may have the staff report, James, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, I'll start quickly with a little bit of background because this uh, originated a few years back. So. Uh, on August 1st, 2018, the uh, city's planning commission reviewed and ultimately recommended uh, a movable tiny homes ordinance. That ordinance was presented to the city council on August 28th, 2018, but the city council uh, chose not to adopt the ordinance at that time. Uh, fast forward to earlier this year uh, in April, as we talked about the need for housing and we had a city council meeting which focused on potential housing programs that could help increase housing stock. The city council discussed uh, the tiny home issue uh, at a high level and directed staff to return the ordinance, but in the context of doing a some sort of limited pilot program. So uh, from there, uh, staff has uh, prepared this ordinance and brought it back uh, at this time for the city council to consider. Uh, the ordinance is very similar to the 2018 version, uh, but it's modified to create a two-year pilot program with 10 permits for movable tiny homes issued per year, resulting in up to 20 title, uh, total tiny homes at the end of the two-year period. Uh, to be eligible uh, for uh, a tiny home under this ordinance. Uh, the tiny home must be accessory to a principal residential dwelling unit, which means the tiny, tiny home cannot be the only um, uh, housing unit on, on a site. It must be accessory to, to a, uh, a residential dwelling unit. Uh, and it must meet the following uh, criteria per the ordinance. It must be licensed and registered with the DMV it must meet ANSI standards, uh, which are essentially similar to uh, the standards that an RV uh, will meet, uh, must be towable or on a towable frame. Uh, in other words, it cannot be designed to move on its own power. It can't be an RV with, with its own uh, steering wheel and, and, you know, and uh, steering mechanisms. Uh, it must be appropriate size for public highways so that it can be movable. It must have at least 100 and, uh, 150 square feet of first floor living space, must include living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation areas, must be designed to look like a conventional building. In other words, it should look like a house, not like, a, uh, like, not like an RV, uh, or, or at least like a convention, it should look like a conventional building. Uh, it must be sited behind the principal dwelling unit, uh, in other words, it should not be in front of the, uh, the residential property. It should be behind that and between the housing unit and the rear setback. It must be placed on a permanent, 
permitted permanent foundation with wheels removed or with leveling uh, and support jacks to prevent movement. Uh, and it should have an all weather surface pedestrian path from the street to the main entrance of the tiny home. Uh, it should also have at least 80 square feet of exterior decking. And uh, one of the big issues that the planning commission really dug into was what the, re the utility requirements should be and uh, ultimately decided that essentially the ordinance says that as long as it's the same utility requirements that a, an ADU would have, uh, that it, it uh, which is essentially that it be approvable by our building official, that it would be sufficient. So it must at least have the same utility requirements as an accessory dwelling unit. The ordinance also includes a prohibition on excessive movement uh, that was intended to, among other things, make sure that these don't become short-term rentals that move in and out of properties uh, uh, frequently. So each parcel will only be allowed to have one tiny home at a time and only one per year under this ordinance. Uh, and then um, those, are the, those are the key criteria. Uh, one, a couple of comments that I know were important uh, issues discussed last time around is that um, at this time, it's unclear how uh, the state and our uh, regional housing needs assessment or RENA numbers would be impacted by tiny homes. Um, and it's also not completely clear how the property tax impact uh, uh, could be impacted, but the city's uh, belief is that if the wheels are removed and the home is placed on a permanent foundation, that that would likely be considered a permanent improvement that would trigger reassessment. But those are kind of two pending issues as these are uh, kind of a new area of law, especially within Ventura County. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned, it's a two-year pilot program is what's pr uh, proposed in the ordinance. The ordinance also includes a requirement that at the end of that two years, staff will be required to return with a report on the program and with recommendations for for future uh, adjustments. So with that, the uh, ordinance uh, is presented to the city council for discussion and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, James. Mayor Six, I have a couple of questions of staff, if that's okay. Um, James, uh, I have th really three questions. One, just clarifying that um, this is very clear that this is an ADU in terms of count. So in other words, you can't add an ADU if, if you put it, if you have a permit for one of these, or if you already have an ADU, then you can't get a permit for one of these. It's a mutually exclusive, right? My understanding? Yes. Yes, uh, Council Member, Mayor President Weirich, that is noted in the ordinance, attachment A, page three, towards the purpose section, uh, movable, limited pilot project to permit movable tiny houses as an additional type of ADU. Right. And then the other question I had really quick, um, I'll just combine uh, the two into one. There are two model codes from the National Fire Protection Agency that I believe are applicable. One is 225 labeled Model Manufactured Home Installation Standard, which handles the uh, foundation. Uh, stem walls and utility hookups for uh, that we're talking about here in the dual permit system. And the other is NFPA 1192, which is a, a, a standard a fire safety standard for recreational vehicles that other jurisdictions have applied to tiny homes. I was just wondering if, if those were considered uh, for inclusion as uh, standards in this permitting or not, or whether you think it's not applicable. I think uh, so. The uh, we had a, a meeting yesterday, actually a BAP, uh, building appeals board meeting to talk about fire um, right. uh, uh, related issues and fire hardening. And the building official at that meeting, so I'll repeat for this meeting, is the building official noted that he is uh, investigating whether or which um, potential fire code requirements would apply to tiny homes. Uh, but we don't have that answer okay. definitively at this point. Well, I just did some research in other jurisdictions, and those are two that pop up, NFPA 225 mm -hmm. for the foundation and NFPA 1192 for the uh, tiny home itself. Yeah. But I just thought I'd bring it up for possible consideration. 
and inclusion. All right, I have a Thank question. you. Randy? I just had one question for staff. You know, we talk, um, it talks in here about uh, ADUs being connected to public sewer systems. Um, how are they impacted on a site that um, has septic and most septic um, tank installations have fixture counts and um, a determined amount of uh, sewage on an annual basis. I don't see anything in here that, that talks to that at all. So the, the ordinance as drafted essentially says the tiny homes are gonna be treated the same as accessory dwelling units and that the uh, property owner, much like an ADU, uh, when they propose it will have to uh, meet the uh, requirements of the building official. So there isn't one standard answer, but when each item, which when each uh, tiny ho home comes before the building official, he will review it just as he would an ADU. And in certain circumstances, that may mean uh, if septic would be allowed, that that would be allowed. Uh, and in other cir circumstances, that may not be allowed. So it's it's just uh, there's not a uh, one standard answer. It's dependent upon what would be allowed if, if it were just an ADU. So. Thank you, James. I have a, que a question, uh, Mayor, or comment for me. Um, this, this morning I received um, a, um, a question from someone who was concerned because someone had put an RV in their backyard right by their fence and it was quite high and it blocked their view. And I think it's really important for the public to understand that um, what our city manager just said, all the um, <clears throat> rules and regulations that apply to all other accessory dwelling units will apply uh, to tiny tiny house, these tiny houses on wheels. It will look like a house. It has to be placed a certain district, a, a certain distance, distance from the property line and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this but there's and there's height restrictions there should not be the the, the problems that some people have with um RVs like RVs are can be humongous I had my neighbor had one permanently in their driveway and it, it totally blocks the view this is completely different from a giant RV it looks like a house and then um, if there's any is, is any comments on that, and I have one more question. That's just I'll, I'll note that, yes, exactly. And, and the the positive thing about the way it's drafted right now, where the um, the city's building and planning do uh, review and permit the foundation, so that uh, we will through that process make sure that the foundation is located appropriately and that it's not just you know placed somewhere where it's in somebody's setback or too close to the property yeah. line. My, my other question is this, um, there are some people, and I was asked by a homeowner who has a very large property, um, actually she's not there anymore, but she had a huge property on North Signal, for, and that's just an example. Her house is set way back, there's no backyard, all the yard is in front, and she wondered if she could get, uh, what you would call it an exemption, Lucas, for, I mean, we don't have to, ha I, we don't have to have that, but it's a question that has come up. If you if you don't have a backyard, but but your front yard is set far from the road. Yeah, I, I think um, as drafted, uh, the ordinance requires that it's in between uh, behind the house and before the rear setback. So I don't uh, b believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there was any ex exception for other than that. There was no exception built into the current ordinance. The property owner in this case could seek planning commission review and approval through a variance okay, if they can yeah. show that something about the property, perhaps preservation of another of a geographic feature, oak tree, something like that could justify yeah. variance, but it would require a variance. That, that, that was my question. Thank you. A variance. Thank you. And I just want to say, I thought the staff report was excellent and um, the ordinance all looks good. Thank you. And James, in relationship to junior ADUs, are there any um, 
we're saying that these are going to count as an ADU. So are we saying that in turn that we can have a junior ADU on the same lot? Yes. Yeah. So these are, you know, essentially treated as ADU. So if you can have an ADU and a, a junior ADU, then you would be able to have a movable tiny home in a junior ADU under this ordinance. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to public comments. We'll start with Bill Miley and then Ray Powers and Diane Squire. <clears throat> Oh. Good evening. And for the record, my name is Bill Miley. I've lived here since 1968. This proposal to add tiny houses on wheels warrants serious review from a living condition viewpoint. Several years ago, I spent lots of time and energy on this issue, especially comparing them to 399 single bedroom modulars and 499 square foot two bedroom modulars. This is an enlarged version of the three dimensional houses I made for the city council. The little blue one is the tiny house on wheels. Some thoughts. They have extremely limited space to walk around and to sleep. They are recreation vehicles rebranded as houses. As tiny homes on wheels, they were designed to be moved about, allowing their users freedom of travel. If you put them on a permanent foundation, skirt them, they become a modular, but not for families. They are very expensive per square foot of living. Modulars are very economical to, build, to buy and live in. Tiny houses are not. Can tiny houses on wheels be used for state regional housing numbers? We don't know. And neither does the state apparently. Modulars are ADUs and can be counted. Tiny houses are too costly to charge a rent level <laughs> that meets an affordable income. It's important to remember this tiny structure has very little storage space and very little inside room to spread out. Our proposed ordinance states that at least 80 square feet deck needs to be built. And they must be behind the primary house. But there's going to be a lot of outside living, folks, because there's no space inside. Regarding heating and cooling, heating is no problem. It's small, although a loft bedroom upstairs, the loft, will have to have some sort of a recirculating to get the heat up there or heat down. Cooling in Ohio will be mandatory. Air conditioning units are extra cost. Because of the loft structure, be needed, it will need to be a circulation function to get the cool, up, cool, up, cool air upstairs. Modular units don't have lofts, so they're all one level. They can be heated and cooled very efficiently. In summary, Tiny houses and wool on wheels are not best for our city. Modular homes are best. The tiny house pilot demonstration will show what? In my opinion, they won't show that it will help our workforce housing needs. So please seriously consider going for modular, not tiny houses. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next, we have Ray Powers. break this mic in. Thank you, Council. Thanks for bringing this back up for discussion. I do agree with some of what Mr. Miley spoke about. I have some 
uh, other things, and um, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. But I'm glad you're introducing this ordinance, though I do find it very limited in scope in terms of affordable housing. Are we going to need to make a separate ordinance for Cobb and Super Adobe and yurts and geodesic domes and other types of affordable by design housing? That's a point I want to make. So I'm all for this ordinance but I think it's very limited in scope in terms of really making housing affordable. What's going to prevent a homeowner from building a $120,000 uh, tiny home? Because that seems to be what they're coming in at, $110,000, $120,000. And then charging whatever costs they want for rent. They could still be charging $1,200 to live in a 125 square foot home. How are we going to address that? A yurt, a geodesic dome, Cobb, Super and Dobby, much more affordable if we expand our scope. I remember a few years ago, Councilman Wyrick, uh, Councilwoman Francina, myself, uh, Kathy Nolan from the Planning Commission. I was on the Planning Commissioner there. We met with Bill Kelly from Marin County who wrote their green building ordinance for Marin County that made Cobb legal up there so people could build Cobb. If you don't know what Cobb is, it's basically soil, mud, and water. And what many of the homes in England and Europe and the Middle East and even Africa are built of, and they've lasted hundreds of years. Considering Quail Springs is almost done with their Cobb seismic and fire testing, and they'll probably be done with that within a year. And Ventura County Building Inspectors uh, is very supportive of that. I would seriously consider allowing people to do that. So I'm asking you to just expand your consciousness on what is affordable housing by design. Because honestly, realistically, I don't think you're going to get 10 tiny homes a year, honestly. They're expensive to build. They're very unique. They're beautiful because they're custom. Um, but I don't know how many people are really going to live in them. And as a homeowner, as wanting to be a new homeowner, can you afford $120,000 to build a tiny home versus twenty or 30000 for a year? I think it was a big mistake to shut all the yurts down a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Next we have Diane Squire, and then after that, Leslie Hess and Wendy Hilgers. I'm a, a co-manager of an apartment complex here in Ojai at the end of North Ventura Street, 34 units, Ojai Gardens. When I first moved there 13 years ago, I paid $907 a month for a two-bedroom, one-and-a-half bath unit, townhome style. That same unit is now renting for $2,200 per month. All of our tenants just got additional rent increases. I, I like the idea of allowing tiny homes as a pilot project. It's one option in a total mix that you really need to consider. I concur with Ray that you need to allow or consider other options. I have in that complex four seniors, no five, over 85 years old and they're getting priced out. And so Ojai really doesn't have affordable housing available anymore. When we just rented that two bedroom in May, I had 10 people waiting to try and get it. And many of them out of town so that you're, you're not only closing out affordable housing for locals, but you're doing it for seniors as well. And you really need solutions in this town if you're gonna grow. Now I think tiny homes are a great way to go for those who want them. It's one piece of the puzzle. The cob, yurts, other options are other parts of the puzzle. 
In fact, I'd love to see some land dedicated that would allow the development of, say, a tiny home, your Cobb Village, as a test pilot in Ojai. But I think basically you really need, it's almost like this ordinance in a two-year pilot is a little too little too late. People need attention now to affordable housing. Even if you put up a tent city, it'd almost be better. It's, it's very hard for people on limited incomes. And I'm a senior, I know. I can't afford a home. I can't afford one. I'll probably never in the rest of my life be able to. I could build a tiny home. I could build a hot cob home. Whether I could afford the land is another issue. But it's something we just encourage you all to think bigger. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next we have Leslie Hess and then Wendy Hilgers. Good evening, everybody. I may go over to this. I don't know how I feel about tiny homes, but I am in fan, a fan of providing homes for those of modest means. I encourage you tonight to direct staff to investigate our options. For, it's a little hard to hear. I encourage you tonight to ask staff to investigate our options for rent stabilization and deed restricted availability of tiny home pads so that they serve only those who need them the most. Mobile home pads are rent stabilized in some areas of Ventura County and in other counties. We have the opportunity to do that with tiny home pads here in Ojai. This maintains housing availability for very low and extremely low income families. Once you allow tiny homes with no clearly defined affordability controls, it could be very difficult, if not impossible, to change course later. The time is now. Most of what is proposed in Ojai's draft housing element does not ensure housing for those of modest means. Using affordability measures in this ordinance is an effective way to serve those of modest means first, not serve them last. Before proceeding with this ordinance, please direct staff to explore the city's options to regulate the rental of tiny home pads so that they are available to very low and extremely low income families. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Wendy Hilders. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I did send a short letter to each one of you requesting that this be um, sent back to the Planning Commission because there really are a lot of things that need to be discussed. But even more important than my letter, I think, was the fact that the chair of the Planning Commission made a similar request. It's very complicated. I think talking about um, ADUs, which are homes built on permanent foundations, and a uh, tiny home on wheels is built on a trailer frame and moved on to a permanent uh, foundation on property. The foundation is permanent, but the, the recreational or the tiny home on wheels is just strapped to it or put onto it some way, but it can be removed again and moved again, it talks about that in the ordinance. But I think basically, I don't understand how the city can go ahead and have a two year pilot program for something like this, which the HCD still has not approved to be counted in the RAINA numbers. And um, one other thing, and cannot be included in the low income housing pool. So there are just a lot of other issues which I think still need a lot of um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. 
Gail, any public comments on Zoom? We had one, but he has already spoken tonight in person. So no more. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to discussion. Should I, should, should I go ahead? Okay. So you want, you want to start? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I'm a renter myself, and my little hovel is for sale on North Ventura Street for close to a million dollars. It's a it's a teardown for sale for a million dollars. Unheard of. It's unheard. It's just it's it's crazy. It's crazy. But that's the world we live in. I am <coughs> intimately familiar with the housing crisis. I've lived in my van. I've had my stuff. I had my stuff in storage for two years before I found the house I'm in. I've, I've leased it for eight years now. And there were 50 people that wanted that house. I was lucky to get it and I'm grateful for it. And I'm kind of hoping that the new owner will let me stay. But <clears throat> I think the most important thing to realize is um, that tiny houses are not meant to be a substitute for all the other housing that has been discussed by the public tonight. You know, what Bill uh, Miley, his a pre, what do you call it, the prefab housing, that's legal. There are now prefab tiny houses as well, and they're beautiful. And <clears throat> I don't know if all of you that uh, were commenting have ever lived in a tiny house. I haven't actually lived in one, but I've spent many hours in one. And the, the way they're built the way they, uh, it's just ingenious how you can function. You know, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. So I don't know if you, those of you who are opposed to them, if you have spent time in them, you might have a different pers perspective. Um, I, I feel that we need all the options that were discussed tonight. We can't uh, have an ordinance at the moment that covers everything. We can't, I don't think we can mix it up. Um, but I think that the ordinance before us is very reasonable. I'm interested to hear what my colleagues, if they want to tweak it a little bit, but it is my hope that it passes. And uh, I'm interested in the comment about making the pad affordable. Maybe the city um, attorney or uh, Lucas can comment on that. I wasn't clear if that could be added to the ordinance or exactly how that would work. Um, and I think that's all I, I have at, at the moment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Sticks. Um, yeah, it's about choice, adding a choice, not preempting any choices. Um, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, we need to be looking at well-designed modular homes. We need to be looking at alternative building methods that Mr. Powers brought up. We need to keep going. This is about adding one choice and a uh, that something that's been vetted before for a long, you know, uh, that has come back with the stipulation of let's try something. Uh, a maximum of ten per year. Uh, a maximum of 20 over two years. Um, I just think it's important to um, try some things. And this is a good, a well-vetted example of, a, of trying something on a, in a pilot program. And we're going to learn from it. And I think that's, that's a good thing. On the issue of per, rent permitting, rent, uh, uh, excuse me, rent regulation on the um, on the pad, I'm not sure how that would work, considering that you know you're putting something on that um, uh, permitted pad, and um, I'm just you know I, I'm I'm open to thinking about it, but I don't really see how it would work, especially in a pilot program. I am interested though in what I mentioned in my questions. There are a couple fire protection standards that I think we ought to be looking at considering an inclusion in this for when it comes back for another reading and that's uh, NFPA 225 and NFPA 1192. I, I really would like staff to look into that um, and see if uh, those would be appropriate. But I'm, I'm leaning towards uh, with those inclusions and 
specifically with a very uh, a, a commitment to keep going in terms of looking at modular, in terms of looking at alter bringing back and start looking at modular building methods. I've looked at the 3D. Um, I, I'm thinking that might be that uh, East Austin tiny home village area. I know, uh, and I've seen that working. I mean, those are the kinds of things we really, really need to be looking at. And um, yeah, I, I've seen them happen. And uh, I, I visited that, that tiny home uh, village affordable housing homeless program in East Austin. I'm not sure if this is the same land. It's about 20 acres. Must be something else. But I'm very interested in, in other things. But what we have before us today is adding a choice. And um, that's what I think we should do. Right. Okay. Sure. Um, apparently, I've been picked to go next. Um, you know, housing in Ohio is a funny thing. For 20 years, it was we don't want any more density. We don't have enough water. There's too much traffic. Then over the last few years, it's been we need affordable housing. Here we are with a potential proposal that maximizes the living space at what is approximately a 20 by 22 foot space with the minimum being a 15 by 10 foot space in someone's backyard with a path so you can get in and out of it for something that's gonna cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yet we're not willing to entertain the idea of affordable housing on the Cardi property across from Nordoff where there's been multiple proposals for things over many, many years. This town has come out and said, we'll never have three stories. We'll never allow it here. We'll never allow it there. Don't put it in our backyard. And yet here we are pleading to put in what is the worst form of housing imaginable. It's temporary at best, it's movable, it's expensive for the space, it's high per square footage, it doesn't count towards RAINA numbers, it has incredibly high utility costs for its size, and when you get done with all of that, they can just pick it up and move it somewhere else if they don't like it in their backyard anymore. We can't control the rental costs on these really, and it's incredibly difficult to think that putting people in homes that don't build wealth, that don't increase in property values is somehow going to be the answer to the housing crisis in general. It's a great answer for people that have no living quarters at all, but trying to reduce the cost and putting people in 20 by 22 square foot homes is not habitable. It's not the long-term solution. This might help a little bit, but this is not the answer. And we forget that there is a tried and true tested, most efficient way to build lowest cost housing. It's called apartments. But every time we talk about apartments, what does the public come out and say? Not in Ojai. We don't need any more of those. Too much traffic. We don't have enough water. Don't want them in my backyard. So this is very difficult. This is, a, this is the wrong answer for the wrong problem at the wrong time. I'm not saying it's necessarily worse than what we have now, but the idea that putting out at most 10 of these a year is somehow going to even dent, even make a small little difference in the housing crisis that is Ojai, that is California, that is Southern California, that is most of the Western states. This isn't it. We have not seen anywhere where a community has gone to a robust, tiny home fixing of everything. And we forget that the main problem here isn't the cost of the dwelling above the ground, it's the ground itself. The land in California and specifically in Ojai is not cost effective to try and get lower income families, people, individuals into homes. It's really, really difficult. What is, is when you stack them on top of each other and you maximize the space, when you put in apartment buildings and other things, that's how you maximize the dollar value and get things as affordable as they can be. But we don't want to talk about that. So let's not kid ourselves. For 50, 100 years of Ojai, we have let this problem fester. We as a community have not accepted our responsibility to do anything differently about it. When we've had opportunities in the past, we said, heck no, not in our backyard. And even today, as we sit here entertaining this idea, there's a proposal on the Cardi property to put in hundreds of affordable units. But I've gotten more calls about how much we don't want those than I've ever gotten calls on how much we want tiny homes. So it's difficult. We have marginalized lower cost living into Oakview, into Casita Springs, into Miners Oaks, because what? We don't want it in our backyard in Ojai. And we've done nothing to support that. I've gotten more complaints over Whispering Oaks than I've ever heard anybody call me and go, we need another Whispering Oaks. 
So, you know, are, are we prepared to really do what it takes? Are we prepared to find a program that really robustly can change what affordable housing is in Ohio for the people that need it, seniors and specifically low income, younger families? Because there's a reason why our school district is running out of kids. There's a reason why we have deficiencies across the board. And it is not an unwillingness by the council to do it. It's been an unwillingness by our public for decades to want to do it. And a council that's mirrored that. And here we are trying to put the smallest little fix of anything in someone's backyard if it fits right and it has a little path and it's up to 400 square feet. I mean, I, I wouldn't let my mom live in a 400 square foot house. I love her to death. I just wouldn't let her do it. I don't think that would be appropriate. I, I, I imagine living there with multiple people. I mean, how are you really going to be able to do that? That's really difficult. I'm not against people having these in their backyards and using it, but the idea that this is somehow even in the context of fixing a housing crisis, when at most we could put 10 of them in a year, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. And they're not cost effective. And I've stayed in them before. Flying flags up in Buellton, they have tiny homes. It's great for the weekend. They have a beautiful outdoor area. They got a park right outside. They got basketball. All that's not on the property. And they're turning them over as rentals. And what we're going to see is a much more difficult problem that's really probably going to occur, which is people renting them out because it's really hard to enforce short-term rental stuff. And you're not going to see people that want to live in them long term. I mean, are you really going to sign a one-year lease? You got to, if it costs $150,000 to put one of these in, what do they have to rent them out for? per month to make their money back. It's it's a really difficult one. I'm not necessarily against this. I think it's at least a step in the right direction, but even having this in the context of housing and fixing housing is ridiculous to me. This is about supplementing someone's income by doing something that might be cost effective in their backyard to help them continue to live in the house they have, while somebody else is marginalized to a tiny little shack in the back that really isn't functionally livable for a long, long time. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's better than you know, not having a home. But when we're talking about where these places have been villages, that's usually because it is geared towards a community that does not have any shelter at all. And I don't know if that's what we're trying to gear it for by putting these in people's backyards. So I think this is an important topic. I think it's one of the most important topics. I'm from a generation of kids who grew up here that can't afford to live here. I don't know anyone. I'm 40 years old. I don't know anyone who is in my age who I went to high school with that owns a home in the city of Ohio unless their parents help them pay for it. I don't know anybody who's made enough money working here to be able to afford to live here. This isn't a problem with seniors. Look at what the school district numbers are. But putting in tiny homes and backyards is not even close to effectively fixing this problem. So I'm not necessarily against it, but I want to make it real clear. Like, let's change the context of what we're really talking about. Mayor, may I offer another perspective? Oh, okay. So when when uh, when when tiny homes first came up, I think it was about probably Bill four years ago. We met with a couple of people over at right. 10, 10 Penny Construction. Um, I think Chester was sitting on the planning commission. Um, you know, in the beginning, I thought they I, I thought they they might be something. Um, and as we progressed through through the discussion of them, uh, I, I agree with Ryan. I I, um, I don't see them being the panacea that everyone thinks they are. I don't see them being the model of housing in Ojai that's going to alleviate the affordability that we lack. Um, tonight we're not sure about the taxes. Tonight we're not sure about um, the rain in numbers. We haven't talked about parking. We haven't talked about um, how we're going to regulate good tenants and bad tenants and and um, the move on and the move off. Uh, I don't know. I'm having, I'm having a real difficult time supporting this. I think and I believe it's a way of life for some people. And so I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. I'm going to say it's a choice. I just don't know if it's the choice that we want to make for our community. So um, that's where I'm at right now. I'm just not 100% there. Uh, I'd just like to say the key word to pick up on that, Randy, is choice. And, I, and that's what I'm hearing across the board. This is one option among many options, and we need to explore a lot of options because clearly we have a crisis. Uh, I lived in a 300 square foot 
apartment in Japan, and I loved it. I like it super tight. It's a matter of taste and choice, once again. Um, and in terms of an ADU in your backyard, I have an ADU, and I adore it, and I rent it under market. And I've rented it for to teachers who can't afford to live here. So it, clearly we have an issue, and I'd like to reiterate what a couple of um, the public members of the public said. It's got to be for people of modest means or low income, because if that's not, if, if it's just uh, a way for the landowner to rent out, you know, a, a house for $3,000, that's not affordable. So we need rent stabilization uh, and we need a living wage here in Ohio. And, that, you know, that's a bigger issue. On the other hand, to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, no, and this is not an option. We're talking about 10 in one year you know, at maximum. So I think it's really important for us to embrace all the options. I'd like to make another point. I remember vividly when this came up for debate last time and we had some of the same similar arguments about, well, it's not doing enough of this. I'm not doing enough of this. In other words, it kind of got into an issue of the, of the perfect defeating the good. Um, I remember vividly um, seniors saying, I would love to be able to have a tiny home located behind the primary residence that I could stay in yes. and allow my children uh, and their kids to live in the, uh, you know, the front house, the primary residence. And I know everyone's absolutely right. That this is not, yeah, it's not meant to be a panacea. It's not meant to be a, a solution. It's meant to be an added choice to try out in a limited way and see if it provides some benefits uh, to our community. And I just, I just feel that, uh, um, you know, providing a choice for the circumstance that I just laid out uh, and, and some other uh, types of situations like that um, is worth trying. And uh, that's why I just, I just think, especially if we include the, uh, some additional uh, fire safety standards, that it's a good thing to try. Um, I was going to say most of what uh, Bill just said. I also remember retired teachers coming to the podium um, and they want to travel and they would like a, a f another family, their own family or someone else's family to live in their home. And then they can come when they come back from their travels or maybe they want to live very lightly. They're ready to really downsize. They can live in the tiny home. So the tiny, <coughs> small house has the potential of opening up the primary, the larger home for a family. Also, there are communities that have legalized tiny homes for home health care givers, providers. <clears throat> and I worked with as one for many years, and I can't tell you how nice it would have been to leave the home and go into my own space during a break. You know, because this is 24, these are people who need 24 seven care. And oftentimes you, you know, you end up sleeping on their sofa um, and perhaps, or, or, you know, there are situations where you're taking care of your parents or something like that. It's nice to have, you know, that's another way that a, a, a small house, a tiny house on the property can be used. Um, <clears throat> It's definitely appealing to a segment uh, of the population, especially the older population who has raised their family. They want to live very simply and um, that uh, a lifestyle where you're living in a small space and it, it can be is very appealing. And like Mayor Six, I too have lived in, in, in very small spaces, the size of a closet. I wrote books in that space, it can be done. <clears throat> so, so I think these are all good comments. I'm, you know, it's. I don't think we're fighting each other. I think we're just making basic assessments of how we feel about this. Um, you know, again, it's a choice, and um, I'm not sure if the. I'm not sure if the positives outweigh the negatives, and that's. Um, that's how I see it. I think uh, I think if this was a bigger issue, we might have more people here. We've had six people speak to it tonight. I didn't receive one phone call. 
Um, I don't know if tiny homes are a priority in the community anymore, um, like they like they were four or five years ago. So, um, and is it something uh, like Ms. Squire said? Is it something that's too late? Um, you know, we need something bigger. We need something more beneficial to the community. So, uh, if someone wants to make a motion, I'm willing to to listen to it. And um, I just my final comment on this is. I sure hope that when affordable housing comes back to this council, and it will be coming soon, that I hear the same comments that I'm hearing tonight. Mr. Dix, I'll step into Councilman Haney's invitation and we'll see where we go. Uh, I'm gonna make a motion to uh, introduce the ordinance to create a two-year pilot program for inclusion of movable tiny home regulations into the accessory dwelling unit section of the OI Municipal Code with the added provision that staff please explore the addition of uh, NFPA 225 and NFPA 1192 into the permitting standards. I'll, I'll second. Uh, can we add um, an amendment, friendly amendment to direct staff to make uh, tiny homes affordable for modest means, people of modest I, means? I would have no problem exploring what options might be available. I'm not sure how that would work, but I'm open. Okay. Great. Hearing about well, it. Well, um, Mayor, can I make a suggestion on that? Um, it has to come back for a second reading if it passes. M maybe we have staff provide that information to us and we amend it when it comes back. It, yeah, we, we can amend a uh, introduced ordinance. Absolutely. All right. Well, I guess we're ready for a roll call, please, Gail. Councilmember Francina? Yes. Councilmember Blatz? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wyrick? Yes. Council Member Haney? We'll see. Yes. Mayor Stix? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the public hearing is now closed, and we will move on to item number four. Uh, discussion. Review of cannabis regulations, permits, and tax revenue. So um, we have a staff report, James? Yes, thank you. Um, this item, uh, there's essentially uh, two components to uh, this item. One is uh, uh, when the city adopted the uh, cannabis tax uh, back in uh, and certified the cannabis tax back in December, uh, we were, uh, staff was directed to bring back uh, an assessment after about uh, six months of receipts. And so we, we have that assessment back. Uh, and then second is uh, recent, more recently at the June 8th city council meeting, the city council uh, asked staff to um, allow for a broader discussion of potential cannabis options as part of the agenda item. So the items included are intended to allow for a full discussion of, of uh, the cannabis program. Uh, the tax review is very uh, fairly simple. Uh, since implementation in December through about uh, the end of June, which is approximately six and a half months, the city has received one hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars in tax, uh, which is uh, has been consistent at a rate of approximately thirty thousand dollars per month in tax receipts. Uh, we have not seen any major swings uh, as far as an increase or decrease during that time. It's been fairly consistent across those six months. Uh, those receipts have have uh, have come from the city's uh, dispensary businesses. We have not had any receipts from the manufacturing permit that has been issued as they have not begun operations yet. Uh, we also have one more manufacturing permit pending, but that uh, also has not begun operation yet as it's pending. Uh, with the tax review, staff has drafted a resolution that the city council had discussed back in December as well. Uh, the resolution would identify any cannabis revenue or would designate that any cannabis revenue would go towards rebuilding the city's emergency reserves, which have been reduced dramatically due to COVID impacts. We've talked about that a lot over the last year that our initial $3.4 million in reserves had dropped to below $1 million. We've started to rebuild it, but um, the city council, when we discussed this prior, had indicated an interest in 
in designating any funding to rebuilding that until we get back to our reserve goal. So the attached resolution uh, uh, does exactly that. So if council adopts that resolution, it would designate those fundings to the uh, that funding to the emergency reserve. Uh, so that's kind of the tax review. The other uh, thing, as I mentioned, is the um, some of the different ideas and questions and, and proposals for potential modifications to the cannabis program. Uh, some of those include questions about whether the city would allow an expansion of business hours. City's current regulations are 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. The state allows broader hours than that, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. So the city could expand those hours if the city council desires. Uh, the other questions uh, relate to whether to allow cannabis businesses in other zones besides the industrial M1 MPD zones, whether to uh, consider allowing um, product sampling, on-site com consumption, or um, uh, our, uh, product sampling or on-site consumption, which are currently prohibited because the city has a non-smoking uh, in public places ordinance under the current code. Uh, and then the other, uh, another question that has arisen is whether to allow indoor nursery only cultivation licenses, which would require a code amendment. And so those are just some examples of some of the topics that have come up. Uh, but the request from the council was to um, allow for a full discussion of, of potential changes that may be desired. So with that, uh, our recommendation is that the city council adopt the resolution to designate the funding to the emergency reserve and to identify any other potential issues that um, to direct staff to investigate further for um, a more thorough discussion at a future city council meeting. So we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, James. Questions? A, a quick question, just to make sure I understand. Uh, right now, our, there's a statement on uh, page 205, 4-2, on the uh, distribution license where it says the state requires manufacturers to obtain a separate distribution license from the state however the omc already allows the two manufacturing businesses to secure manufacturing our dis distribution licenses could you clarify exactly what that means they, the, the, there's no way to change the state requirement for separate licenses is that what i'm seeing there but the ohio municipal Code already allows the two manufacturing business to uh, uh, apply for those additional licenses if they want. Is that is that what I'm reading? Yes. So right now, the two manufacturing licensees uh, that can be allowed in the city are also allowed to be distributors without any trouble um, under the city's code. And I, as I understand it, the question is, can the existing retailers, those three... Right, add, that was my sec the second bullet. I was going to get to that. Okay, yeah. So on the first bullet, yes. The state requires a distribution license and a manufacturing license, and the city allows both for the two slots for manufacturing. Okay. And so the, the issue of existing retailers is whether or not we could allow them to modify the code so that they could apply for a, a separate distribution license, which would then allow them to basically vertically integrate without being a micro business for some of their products? Yes, that's the request, as I understand it, is okay. to allow that integration. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, my question would be, how do you propose to handle this? Because it seems like we should go through each choice that we that's before us maybe after the public yeah comments? let's do public comments yeah. first um so we have jeff kroll chelsea satula michelle rosenblum and reno Rollet, please so let's start with jeff thank you can you hear me okay okay um i'm jeff kroll with shangri-la the president of shangri-la what was i i need a little clarification what Mr. Warwick said about type 12, I've been under the impression that the three retailers could apply for a micro, which is called a type 12 license. Is that correct? Yes. For All micro, right, well, yes. we signed a three-year lease to do just that. 
and to stay within the 7,500 square foot limit, which the state limit is 10,000. This discussion about cannabis, I'm mainly concerned about the cost because when we bear a cost of 15% on products, another cost of 3% on the gross sale, we pass that on to the customer. We're pricing ourselves out and we're boasting the black market. There are more black market right now, just because of COVID and the fact that delivery services are now coming into Ojai. Do they have to have a business license? in order to do delivery within the city limits. My impression is if they come from an original location like Port Wayne, they do not. So the three of us have probably suffered a 20% loss just in the last year for the COVID people doing curbsides and also delivery. So we need to really clamp down on those that are not permitted properly and not paying their fair share. I don't have a problem paying 3% of my gross income if I can afford it. I am affording it at this point. And I don't have a problem, you resolution to put it in an emergency fund. I trust you will use it wisely and efficiently. I knew that when we first started the cannabis back journey back in 2010, the, there were no fees applied to city. So very, we benefited years without that fee. We're okay with it at this point. Please don't raise it. It's just going to make the product more expensive. And I think it should be noted that I don't think the public was properly informed. We are not allowed to write off expenses. The 280E IRS rule still considers that our income is contraband. I've had seven bank accounts closed by the request of banks because of this industry not being accepted at a federal level. I've also experienced that I am paying half of my total gross income to salaries that I cannot write off. I can't write off the 3% city fee as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Next we have Chelsea Satula, please. Good evening, council, staff, mayor. Thank you um, for having these topics on the agenda tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to keep this to three minutes. We'll see how it goes. I wanted to briefly touch on just how things are going in the industry. I'm Chelsea, Sesby Creek Collective. Um, It's pretty stable. It's pretty flat for us, as Jeff kind of alluded. We do have increasing competition from our brands are now delivering direct to consumers. Uh, A lot of them are from the nearest big hub, which is right now Port Wainimi, it's going to be Oxnard this year. Oxnard has approved 16 dispensary licenses to open up, and they're going to be starting to come on board anytime now. Um, so we do have a lot of competition coming online. Ventura's uh, application period closes tomorrow. They're allowing five dispensaries and 10 industrial licenses. Um and, uh, you know, wildfires up north, industry consolidation, big cannabis in our backyard, the Hewlings uh, Camarillo thing, it's all big cannabis and it's really kind of breathing down our small cannabis neck right now. So I appreciate the opportunity to think about ways we can expand our revenue base without jacking the rate up. Cause I think in, in the long run, that's gonna be unsustainable for the city to replenish its uh, reserves. Um, one of the things I wanna say in particular about Oxnard is that they've really, um, allowed the dispensaries to set up in ways that are more accessible and more visible to consumers that are looking for their products than we've done in Ojai. We've kind of taken this tiptoe step approach. Back in 2017, when we opened, we were all put on the same cul-de-sac on Bryant. And that's, that's nice and safe and it's great parking, but it's really, I get every, almost every day, people that don't know I'm there that live in Ojai. So I think if you want to talk about re- increasing your revenue, we want to make it a little bit more accessible and visible to people, more accessible um, to public transportation than trolley. It's really kind of sad to see people in their wheelchairs going all the way up and down Bryant to get to our shop. So as part of Operation Narco, Normalize and Respect Cannabis in Ojai, I have proposed that we expand the hours to 10 p.m. Um, I think there's a, a deep and long-standing well of interest in our community to have alternatives to 
bars and alcohol. And this is one harm reduction solution to alcohol I think a lot of people are hungry for. We want to have safe spaces, legal spaces where tourists at Sangat hotels can actually smoke a joint because they can't do that in their room legally. Um, people in federally funded senior facilities can't legally smoke a joint or a vape in their rooms. Um, there's just, you know, people are already consuming, right? They're, they're doing it in their cars, maybe they're doing it behind the alleyway, behind the restaurant, and they go about their business. It's not a big deal. So what we're asking the city to consider to keep us competitive with 16 dispensaries in Oxnard, five in Ventura, is to think about ways we can enhance the experience of coming to Ojai. You're already here coming to get your cannabis. Maybe you want to sit and enjoy some Revel kombucha or some beacon coffee or some magic hour tea while you sit and consume something that relaxes you. Um, you know, I think it would just benefit the, the city to form another working group to talk through all the little points. Distri distribution licenses, that's another thing. Um, if I wanted to private label right now, I couldn't do that because I don't have a distribution license. I didn't want to be a micro business because I couldn't do that in my space. Um, but currently as a retailer, I, I can't get a standalone distribution license. The other thing I think would be worth considering for the uh, nurseries, we, um, we sold a lot of clones and seedlings, baby cannabis plants to Ojai residents this year. And they brought a lot of joy. People love gardening here. They love growing their own. And we're really about supporting that. Um, right now we have to import all those seedlings and clones from LA. And so I think that's a really um, easy, non-obnoxious, there wouldn't be odors. We're talking about little baby plants that don't have any you know, flowering buds on them. It's another license type, another license fee, another application, another source of cultivation tax revenue for the city. You might want to consider right now, it's all going to LA. So thank you for your consideration. Again, I'd love to be part of a working group if you want to get one going. Um, the, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chelsea. Could I, Mayor Stick, could I ask Chelsea a quick question? Sure. Uh, is your vision for the the, the baby plants mm -hmm. to be combined with the retail operation or to be separate from? They would have to be separate facilities. Yeah, okay. um, we wouldn't be able to grow at the same in the same facility. So it would be a separate facility. It would be separate. Thank yeah. You. Mm -hmm. okay. Good questions. Next, we have Michelle Rosenblum, please. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Michelle, and I also work with Suspi Cree. Thank you for taking the time to hear this matter. Um, I wanted to start with a, a description of Ojai that I found on our Wikipedia page. It says, Ojai is a tourism destination known for its boutique hotels, recreation opportunities, hiking, and farmer's market of local organic agriculture. It has small businesses specializing in local and ecologically friendly art, design, and home improvement. Chain stores are prohibited by city ordinance to encourage local small business development and keep the town unique. I think there's a lot of really great things in here that describe Ojai. I think we'd all agree that Ojai is a gem of Ventura County. And, uh, but there's some things here to unpack. As Chelsea mentioned, you know, with tourism, I, re I recently traveled up to Cambria and I had with me my own cannabis and uh, where I stayed, I couldn't, I couldn't consume it. And there's no place in public to do it. There's no place in the hotel to do it. And here we are selling product that our, our own tourists can't consume. Um, they have to go elsewhere or they have to hide somewhere to do that. That doesn't seem right. Um, the other thing that I'm taking from this is uh, to try to stay within the time here. Uh, the main thing is that Ojai is unique. It's a, it's, a, it's a destination and not just for tourists, but for local tourism also. You know, I've been in Ventura County my whole life. And I remember being a small child when I was first living in Moore Park. And uh, my mom would take us to Ojai just to spend the day in Ojai. We've got the park, we've got Libby Bowl, we have the arcade. Um, and that stayed with me my whole life. But now as we hear with, with Oxnard and Ventura opening up a lot of dispensaries, a lot of our business, you know, we're delivering also, and we deliver into Ventura. Some of that's gonna go away. You know, when there's dispensaries in Ventura, why are people going to come to Ojai to get their cannabis when they can stay in Ventura and get it there? Um, 
we're trying to replenish the, you know, the reserves, it sounds like, for emergencies. If we're trying to raise taxes for the city, I think a good solution is looking at these other cannabis options like on-site consumption or uh, you know, some of the other um, avenues that Chelsea and, and Jeff had, um, had explained. Uh, and so in, in an effort to keep our town unique, you know, people wanna come here to go to the spa. They wanna come here for our beautiful hiking and our gorgeous weather. <laughs> you know, it's cold in Ventura right now. It's lovely up here in Ojai tonight. And uh, I think a big draw to have people come to Ojai would be something special, an experience like on-site consumption in a great way that can be organic and artful and bring community together in a lot of wonderful ways that, uh, that adults can enjoy without alcohol and the standard thing. Let's make Ojai special. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Next, we have Reno Rolle. Good evening, council, staff. Uh, thank you, by the way, for your service to the community. And I love this venue. Really great to hang out here in the park, in the bowl. But uh, my name is Reno Rollet. I live here in town, have for almost 20 years. And I do uh, operate two businesses in town, one of them being uh, the first Type 7 manufacturing facility, uh, not currently operational, but I believe the first licensed in Ventura. So on the uh, concept of expanding the revenue base from cannabis, I want to say I'm strongly in favor of the strategic expansion of the revenue base, uh, strategic development of new revenue streams. I think it's fantastic. But I just want to once again point out that I think we need to be sort of inclusive of Ojai residents. Um, I don't expect special treatment. I just, when we talk about possibly expanding beyond Bryant Street, out into the east end of town, uh, I love the idea of consumption on site. I think it's remarkable. I've actually experienced it here in California. I would just like to say for the record that um, I want to be included in that application process. And I hope the council will consider the fact that I am a resident for 20 years. I have voted and paid taxes here in town for nearly 20 years. And I think I'm the only one in terms of all the current operational uh, cannabis businesses here in town. The other comment I wanted to make is uh, with regard to the resolution for tax. It may be too late, but I think if we consider possibly allocating a portion of that beyond the emergency fund to uh, fire safety hardening, I think would be an interesting concept. So um, thanks again. Have a great evening. Thank you, Reno. Uh, Gail, any Zoom comments? No, we had one, but that person spoke in person. OK, thanks. We'll move on to discussion then. Here six. I, I just. Um, I wanted to bring in kind of a, an overall perspective here. And I'm, I'm gonna tie together what came out of the, uh, what I thought was a really interesting few general plan workshops. And what we heard um, again and again and again in those general plan workshops was, we need to find a way to expand our employment base that uh, allows more people to, uh, uh, work here uh, and not commute because we have a very high percentage of people that leave um, in order to uh, for their employment. And we need to protect our um, M1 MPT, MPD zone uh, for uh, integrating or vertically integrating and broadening that economic base so that we don't lose uh, the one area where manufacturing is viable. And we um, also um, have an area, uh, and this came up in the general plan workshops, we have an area um, uh, uh, east of Park that um, could probably use some help. And I just, putting all that together, I just, it was food for thought for me to think. How, uh, and, and, and then adding to that the flood of new permits that are coming in other parts of Ventura County. We were pioneers here. The rest of the county is doing catch up. And um, I think that we put all that together and we ought to really think seriously about how to um, consider uh, locations uh, outside of the manufacturing uh, M1 MPD zone in a way that is within Ohio's character 
and allows um, expansion of this of this employment in this sector, uh, which is an important. Um, I think it's just one piece. I know you know. I hope we don't get caught into that. This is you know not solving everything in terms of uh, expanding our ability to uh, to work and live here, but. I think when we, we see these opportunities and we see an opportunity of maybe uh, artfully and thoughtfully um, allowing our local friends and neighbors that are operating these dispensaries in the, in the really an Ojai way um, to be given some tools to be uh, uh, viable going forward in the face of the changes going on in the county. So I'm willing to I'm, gonna, I'm willing to look through some of these uh, ideas for further study. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I'm in full support of the comments made by my colleague, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bill Weirich. Uh, in addition, um, I think, you know, we need to get rid of the double standard. I think alcohol is sold in about 50 places in, uh, in the Valley and uh, it's, way more problematic than um, than uh, cannabis as far as the negative effect. Um, I myself, I, I need, I'm just a prude. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't go out. I don't party. I'm just a nun. So, but I'm completely, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm completely in support of um, the proposals that um, Chelsea has made. We received a, a kind of a slideshow of what she had, her vision. Um, I also, I want the public to really understand uh, that at the federal level, and if I'm not saying this quite right, someone can correct me, but the fact that they can't use the banking system, they cannot deduct expenses, it's a terrible situation. It makes it almost impossible to compete with the black market. It so happens that I've been watching these um, Netflix, I watch, I highly recommend, there's one called Murder Mountain, and it, it documents what happened when, um, when, the, when the small, uh, once illegal marijuana, marijuana cannabis farmers tried to legalize the hardships they went through. And it became, many of them had to go out of business, many of them actually, the, the expense of becoming le legal was out of reach for many of them. It's a very tragic situation. And of course we have, um, we wanna have, we wanna support, I wanna support our small business dispensaries in every way possible because the big guys wanna move in and take over. So now's the time to support um, in a thoughtful way, um, uh, ways that they can expand and be more visible. I'm all for ex ex for um, some of the, the state re the, the state regulations, the, uh, expanding the hours. I'm in favor of that. I'm ex I'm in favor of looking at other areas besides the Bryant Street uh, where they could possibly um, have a, have their business. Um, I think that that's that's all for right now. Yeah, that's all. I wrote, I mean, when we go through this, I know which ones I'm in favor of and, and, and I'm not in favor of. So Mayor, the um, part, part of me as a business owner, um, uh, there's, you know, there's youth, three cannabis uh, proprietors here in town. If you weren't making money, you'd be out of business. So part of me, you know, doesn't buy into the song and dance of woe is me. Um, and it's don't, it's not, it's not personal. It's just, I just don't buy into it. If you weren't doing well, or you weren't successful, you'd be out of business. And you're in business and you're doing well, probably successful. Um, so your competition isn't Oxnard and your competition isn't Port Wyneme your competition is one another. So all three of you are competing in the same arena, in the same community. And again, you're all three very, very successful. That's, that's what I see. 
Um, it's not what I know because I, to be honest with you, haven't been in either or either or any one of your dispensaries because um, I just don't participate in it either. Um, however, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't support you. You're a, you're, we let you in. Let's, let's start with the state of California, let you in. And then the city of Ojai let you into our small community. And to me, there was an agreement that was made at that point in time that um, we want you to be successful because it makes us successful. Um, and so we need to do whatever we possibly can, I think, to help you achieve more success. Because like I said, you're all three vibrant businesses. So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's about hiring more people. I don't know if it's anything like that. I just, I just think that you're our community. You're a member of our community and that, that somehow, some way, we need to support you. I think branding is an issue. I think um, cultivation is an issue. Maybe having cultivation and being able to say that it's ours. You know, when I heard it the first time two or three years ago, I laughed. I, I think I laughed out loud. But the reality is that might help you in business. That might help Ojai in business. Um, so I would think about cultivation. I just don't know at what level. The, um, the thing about moving you into the downtown corridor, that's another big leap for me. But another part of that is the fact that we want you to be successful. And if success means or more success means that you become a fabric of the downtown community, then that might be something that we have to look at also. So I would be in support of more discussion on what we can do and what we should do. But I also want to remove this woe is me attitude because there is no woe here. You three are very successful at what you do. We need to acknowledge that. And then what we need to say is, can we make you more successful, which in turn would make Ojai more successful. So um, that's where I'm at. And then as far as taxes, there was a chart that was given to us that had six or seven other cities. If you did an average on it, the average tax that's being charged is 7% on retail sales. Um, you were gifted the first couple of years with none. You've been paying 3%, which I don't necessarily think is a hardship. So part of me moving forward with you is that you move forward with us and that you consider a higher tax rate on, on your retail side of it. And we can discuss the tax rate on other entities of your business. Thank you. Um... I have, the, I have the strange position here of being the most hated and most loved cannabis user by far on this panel. And uh, I'm going to tell you that I'm very happy with where we set the original tax. Apparently, the alleged 99 or 98 percent of all the profit you guys made didn't put you out of business. So I never bought that for one second. I think we have a very reasonable rate. We're making thirty thousand dollars a month as a city. It's not that extensive, but it helps pay the bills. It's been an important element, especially during COVID, as we saw when our transit occupancy tax dropped to zero. Our cannabis taxes were one of the saviors of keeping us breathing through all of this. So I'm very happy we set it where it was. I don't uh, agree on some of the things, for example, saying that there's nowhere to consume cannabis in Ohio or other places eliminates the entire sector of edibles that you all sell a lot of and are consumable anywhere you want. But that being said, I'm happy. I'm incredibly happy about this because not only is this an industry that I'm from the generation that has never in my life understood why it was prohibited. The prohibition on cannabis has been the dumbest thing this country has sat on for a hundred years. We missed out on many, many things from hemp production to not criminalizing this, to trying to undo this ball of wine, ball of twine that we put together for years and years and years. And the federal government still can't get its head out of its rear end on this. I'm gonna tell you that when the Safe Banking Act passes, if it ever passes, which I would hoped the reason I delayed this down the road a little bit from our original discussion about the 3% taxes, I believed we were close enough that the Biden administration would 
get it done. It's not getting done. But I will rest assured to tell you that, yes, when it passes and you are treated like regular businesses, we're going to revisit this tax and you're probably going to pay more. But I absolutely agree that it's not appropriate right now. And I would not want to cut one of the legs out from underneath you while you're competing against the whole new market. Because even though the prohibition on the city of Ohio is lifted, these other cities are finally realizing that they need to get out of their own way as well. The boogeyman scenarios that were put forth by our sheriff's department, by, by all kinds of different entities about how much criminal activity would be associated with this, how bad it would be, has turned out to be nothing. There's barely been anything bad associated with these businesses, except that they created jobs, they created income, and they created taxes, which last time I checked is kind of what we're shooting for in this job. So I'm incredibly happy about the success that you've seen. I know that we're cutting out some of your profits, but I'm not seeing a massive indication that you're not capable of making it. But I also have said from the very beginning that if we're going to treat you like a legal business, we should treat you like every other legal business. I never thought that putting you off in the M1 down Bryant Street and down Bryant Circle meant anything but other than the weird feelings that generations of people who had stigmas against this were still holding on so tightly to that never made any sense. If you recall, when we first passed this, we had already said as a council that we were willing to consider people, the, the businesses moving out of the M1. But when we met with everybody, they didn't want to. So I have no problem with that. In fact, I think you got to be wherever the heck you want. In any zone where you normally have commercial activity should be treated like every other commercial business and have the opportunity to make money without being hidden. And I don't think it's appropriate that you have three particular dispensaries all stacked right on top of each other where there's an implicit kind of, not competition, unfair competition or lack of visibility that hurts or helps or whatever. I mean, let, it, let you guys be on the free marketplace and, and do what you wanna do. I also think that on-site consumption is a good idea. Now I appreciate that edibles exist. Let's not pretend like they, you guys aren't selling them all, but the idea that you can consume it somewhere, I have no problem with. I, mean, there's, I, I, I think it's a great idea. I don't know how we would quite put that together. I haven't heard my colleagues talk about it much. But if that's something, nobody's put a plan together or a proposal together. But that's something we need to expand to do. And it's going to add jobs and add taxes and be things that people who come to Ojai or live in Ojai want to do. Then why would we want to refrain from doing that? And if we're willing to continue to put in breweries and continue to put in alcohol establishments, it doesn't make a lot of logical sense to lock out cannabis because the associated problems are not there. The reality is that we've done the test and the test has proven that the people who said this was not going to be the end of the world are right. We have not seen a massive criminal enterprise going on in the M1 because of the dispensaries being open. That's a ridiculous boogeyman argument that has been disproven 1000%. So I think we need to and, and I will say this, too. I, I heard the word viable by one of the, the cannabis uh, speakers and the, one of the dispensary owners. I don't want viable. I want successful. I want best success. I want best in the county. I want you guys to be the best in the county at what you're doing. I want you to be alive and vibrant because you know what this city hasn't done and this council hasn't done as long as I can remember is actually supporting an industry that's working and actually trying to do something that betters the lives of Ojai citizens, not just in their recreation, but in their economics. What we constantly do with businesses that are successful is not give them an opportunity to take the next step. And where do they go? They leave town. I got a list of over 20. When they get good, we kick them out. We got to stop doing that. And this one has a specific little tax attached to it that makes it even more important for us to not just let you be viable, but to inhibit, to incubate your success. So I hope we can help do that. And I think that there are some real catalysts in this industry that are going to help. I completely respect the lack of banking ability, credit card use, um, other different factors, you know, federal legalization. All of these things are still making it really, really hard to do your job. And yet you've succeeded. And we've done enough to give you that room. But let's, let's let, let it be to the next level. Let it be where we can not only help you, but you can help us. Because I will say this, next to operating a hotel in town, you pay the most taxes. You help the city the most. And I think the impact has been minimal, if not none. We haven't heard anything negative collectively about these cannabis dispensaries. Now, if they're on Ojai Avenue, are we going to hear more blowback and other things? Sure. 
But at this point, the idea that it's going to cause some massive criminal uprising just is so fraught with just errors. I don't believe it for one second. So I'm really proud of you guys. I want to be supportive. I think this is a great idea. We've, we've always allowed the micro business model. Now, if we want to talk about cultivation, that's a more difficult topic. I know it wasn't something that was entertained really before I got here and it was approved or when we discussed expansion in the M1, but not using up all the M1 space, getting on the commercial areas and allowing, uh, it was always supposed to be that the three various uses under a micro business type 12 license were allowed. And I never thought it was prohibited that you can only do, you had to do all three. If you wanted to do two, you should have always been able to do two. And if that's a problem, then let's make sure we rework that. Because if you want to do distribution and retail, or you want to do manufacturing and retail, you shouldn't have to pick up the extra leg. We want you to be successful in that. Now, I don't know about small plants and these other things about cultivation. I didn't think that was included in cultivation, but we need to discuss that. But if that's a separate part of the market that's important, then, then I think we need to get more information on that. Because I don't know enough in this staff report to be able to say what the potential consequences are. But again, this particular industry is fraught with a lot of people claiming a lot of consequences that we have not seen. We've seen economic benefit. We've seen finance, we've seen jobs created. We've seen really good proprietors who are good members of our community. So I think it's time to reward you for that and open things up a little bit further. But you better understand that I do believe once we get some of these federal regulations that we don't have control over loosened a little bit, Part of that expansion is going to come with a little bit bigger price tag, but I think that's a fair trade. So thank you for everything you guys have done. I know you've been good stewards in our community, and um, I hope that we can not only continue it, but we can make things better for you. Mayor Six, like inspired to... by that, I, I'm ready to. Okay, I just want to say, uh, well, thank you to local business owners for for um, hanging in there, specifically during COVID. And yes, of course, I'm hearing across the board that we want to be super supportive of you. And um, my one, um, I, I think that if I've, I've talked to a lot of people about the, the whole idea of having a cannabis lounge, some people love the idea, some people don't care, some people are dead set against it. So it, it, when it gets to that point, a public discussion would definitely be in order. Um, Absolutely. I, I agree. But clearly this is the way, not even of the future, of the present. And I think, you know, it was when William Randolph Hearst, I think, Ryan, who uh, blocked the, the cannabis back in the whenever it was. But um, moving forward, it's clearly here. And it, um, it was before Ryan's time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, what I was going to do is just um, in terms of a, a motion, I'd like to start with number two, making a motion that staff consider Council Persons Blatt's uh, eloquent summary of direction uh, to be the council's direction for staff investigation in terms of potential changes uh, to the business regulations and permit program to adopt the resolution reaffirming the existing tax and to adopt the resolution uh, <clears throat> designated to the reserves with uh, a caveat that uh, down the road, we will have to be looking at fire hardening funding. That would be my motion. I couldn't hear you at the end, Bill. I'm sorry. What about the, would you say at the, very the end? staff direction? Uh, that, uh, I think Mr. Blatch provided the direction. I, my motion is to endorse what Mr. Blatch just described. Well, I'm going to have a hard time disagreeing with that now, Bill. With, Even uh, if I didn't with, hear you correctly. Uh, be that, I mean, he went point by point by point. Well, and I think what would be more, uh, Bill, I would second your motion if I could hear staff um, repeat back <laughs> what what Ryan's can uh, Ryan's yeah. statement was yeah. because well, it's on video. It was pretty. It was pretty. It was pretty broad and pretty. Uh, and, and that we're channeling the money to the emergency fund. Uh, how about this? How about I let me let me paraphrase it if I will, Mr. Wyrick. Um, okay. We approve the we we continue with the current uh, percentage of uh, taxes as has been the case, and then. Uh, we keep everything else currently the same because all three licenses are allowed is my understanding with the idea that the staff is going to come back um, with additional information about on-site consumption and moving out of the m1 mpd zone strictly um, the only thing i think those are the only two things that would be additional if i'm not missing something the only other question that was pointed to us was uh, hours and 
I, uh, I personally have no problem expanding the hours to the maximum at this point. Uh, so what I would say is in my motion, I would say keep everything the same as it is, including expanding the hours and then have staff come back to us without with a report on on site consumption and moving out of the MPD MP1 district. Would that include further information on the uh, seedlings and the uh, distribution license? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any additional information on that? And I believe that there has previously been sales of those products in the city. So I don't know if it was illegal then or not. I'm not even sure it's illegal. Let me ask you, Mr. Summers, is the seedling tiny plant situation, is that because that's not cultivation, that's sales. Is that allowed in the city right now? It's cultivation or propagation is one of the same. But I, I'm just checking. You might be right. So currently the retailers are allowed to sell the seedlings, but they cannot grow them themselves. So it has to be imported and then sold okay. without any on-site growing facility here. Okay. So and I think I think then to clarify my motion, it would be to bring back some information on that and may require a little discussion with some of the dispensary owners to figure out how we might clean that up if it'll assist them to make that a little bit uh, easier if that's something we desire to do. And I, I'm going to second the motion that he just restated and we'll reverse order here. But I think, again, we're providing direction and council endorsement for further council, a further staff investigation and information. So. That's that's so, as much as I, you know, I'm going to support this, but I'm uh, I'm the only person that's pushed for this um, from day one. And I just want the maximum tax that they can share with us. So I'll support this, but I still believe we need to come back with a higher tax rate than 3%. Um, and the other thing is on cultivation. I was I wasn't aware of the fact that you could import a seedling and sell it. I thought the argument was that you wanted to cultivate so that you had your own brand of cannabis that you were um, uh, manufacturing. Am I mistaken on that thought? Is that? Well, I think, Randy, there's a, some confusion. There's, there's the manufacturing, which are edible products or other types of products that, that could carry a local brand if they're manufacturing those, like um, a concentrate and all the other litany of No, but they're like importing this. all that in. They're bringing all that in. They're not, they're not. No, but they, grow, they could. It was production where that was an issue. As far as the growth itself, we've never allowed it or entertained it. But I think right. that's what we're saying we'll bring back. We can ask for it to come back in two forms. One, as far as selling seedlings and where that line should be drawn about what can happen out of a retail store. But then the second question is pure cultivation, which is actually growing the flower product yourself. And we've never allowed that, but we can review that to see if that's something we want to consider. So James, is that, um, you guys agree, is that part of our look into? Look I, into I, it. I'd allow us to, I mean, just looking into it seems appropriate. Look into it. Yeah. And I think part of the looking into it means to, you know, I know I'll reach out to some of the people I spoke to and I know uh, uh, Ms. Francina spoke to when we were, took the deep dive to figure all this out at the beginning a couple of years ago, but we'll also have the staff talk to some people and see what their desires are because there's no point in us reviewing something if nobody wants to do it but if it's something they want to do then let's take a look at it yeah yeah we'll come back with more information on exactly what each is looking for so well i want to make it clear that that's not an indication that we are somehow supporting cultivation and that has not been something this council supported ever before but we're willing to uh at least take a new look at it in the context of how really successful and uh, appropriate neighbors are this industry has been. And I think you guys, like I said, I think it's done a really good job. It's, it's not easy. And we stacked you all on top of each other. You had to compete against yourselves, which isn't any easier either. And now you got a lot of pressure coming in from the other cities. We don't want to fall behind. We want to keep you out at least a little bit in the lead. Okay. Hey, well, we have a motion. May we have the roll call, please, Gail? Um, for clarification, Council Member Haney seconded that? Yes. Okay. Councilmember Francina? I, uh, wasn't it a uh, motion by Councilmember Wyrick and a second by Councilmember Blatz? I think they reversed we it. We reversed yeah. it. They restated it. Oh, okay. Motion okay. by Blatz, second by Wyrick. We reversed it because. But I was just taking Councilperson Blatz was being much more <laughs> articulate than me. 
Oh, I'm, you can put Haney as a third on that. Yeah. I'm glad I asked them. So be careful what you wish for. All right, let's vote. So it was again. It was motion by Councilmember Blatz and seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Weirick. Then. Yes. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Francina. Yes. Councilmember Blatz. Yes. Mayor Stix. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weirick. Yes. Councilmember Haney. Yes. All right, great. Home run. Uh, thank you very much. And um, let's take a five minute break before we move on to number five, the um, Ojai Wildfire Resiliency Plan. So please don't go away. It's kind of funny. I'm inspired. Yeah.
Um, Randy, will you come back so we can get started, please? <laughs> Okay, we're back. Uh, we're going to move on to number five. It's the Draft Ohio Wildfire Resiliency Plan, or ORAP. And uh, before we begin, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, former Ventura County Fire Chief Bob Roper, who's also the California Fire Safe Council Chair. So we are so lucky to have him and his help um, in crafting this. Also to James, City Manager James Vega for... Um, constant feedback, weighing out on this. Um, Wayne Maynard, thank you so much, fire expert. Our county supervisor, Matt LeVere, Brian Brenner, Brennan from CERT, Ohio Disaster Council, the Ohio Fire Safe Council, the Shepherds, Cole and Michael have all um, given their two cents on this specific plan. And uh, we're really excited that it's here and it's happening. So don't forget Bob Daddy. And Bob Daddy, I could never forget Bob Daddy. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Daddy, for all of your input also. And uh, we're gonna move, uh, we have a staff report uh, from Bob Roper, who's here virtually. So, not a staff report, a, a report. Yeah, and I was planning to just introduce Bob. So I'll, Thanks, James. with that, we'll keep it quick. Uh, Bob Roper uh, is gonna give a, a presentation on, on what's included in the plan. And then uh, I believe also, we had had a uh, presentation from the Fire Safe Council that was supposed to, um, we had planned to occur earlier, but we're actually gonna tie it into this and have a presentation from them as well after. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to uh, retired uh, Chief Bob Roper. Well, good evening, Mayor, members of the council, um, city manager, Bob Roper, Ojai resident. Um, First of all, I wanted to thank the council members and especially Mayor Sticks for asking me about some ideas on what the city could do as a whole to better um, be prepared for wildfires. We all know that some of us lived in town during 1985 and then again during the Thomas fire. And we know it's not a matter of when, it's, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when will the next wildfire hit. Some people have thought that now that the Thomas fire has denuded the hills, that there isn't much vegetation up there to burn. All I can tell you is that with you can get almost anything to burn. So now is the time not to rest on our laurels or get complacent. Now's the time to look at communities like Greenville up on the Dixie fire who was pretty much totally devastated. Just when we thought the town of Paradise uh, was bad, Greenville is another one that's been taken off the face of the, our maps right now. What we really need to understand is that the true cost of any wildfire is not the cost of suppression. That's what you read about in the newspaper. The true cost of a wildfire, there's a citation in my paper that has a great report that really talks about, there's about, um, the cost of wildfire suppression is only about 40% of the total cost. When you look at the overall health effects, environmental, economic, and so forth, the true overall cost of a wildfire is hard to recover from. Most people don't realize that the city of Paradise is being subsidized for a period of five years by the state of California. I would imagine that Greenville will get some of the same type of benefits, but the state can't afford to do that for all of our communities. And that's why we're here tonight to talk about this. Back in um, 2007 and going into 2010, Congress mandated that we come up with a national strategy. Within that, it talked about having a robust response system. It talked about dealing with fuels, restoring our landscapes. And then last part was is to create fire adapted communities that could actually 
withstand a wildfire if no wildfire suppression resources were there. So let's look at those three tenants. Number one, the city of Ojai enjoys a great uh, response and partnership with the Ventura County Fire Protection District, the US Forest Service and CAL FIRE. In a matter of moments, if additional resources are needed, usually they can be uh, acquired from this abundant amount of resources in Southern California. But that's all good if there's no other fires burning. You can see what's happening in the state right now. Fire resources are depleted. So as recently as today, Utah and Texas are sending resources to California to help. But this plan rests on the laurels of the fire agencies that provide the X level of service today. So the city's not getting into that end of this proposal. The next part is restoring our landscapes. When we look at our landscapes, these are usually outside the city of Ojai, but these are the fuels around us that we rely on, the fire protection district, the US Forest Service to deal with the fuels that regrow in our area and how do we lessen the dangers of that. So that area is also not directly dealt with in this proposal. What this proposal really deals with is the question is what can the city do? And really the biggest thing the city can do is be an advocate for its citizens and to create a hardened communities. Again, think about this, a fire adaptive community can withstand a wildfire even if no fire resources are there. That's the ultimate test. So what we wanna really do is to look at this and see where are our, our weaknesses and where are our strengths and let's work on those. So what you have before you tonight is 13 bullet points and I won't go through all the sub bullet points but I'll hit the highlights on here to give you a flavor of what this plan gives. One is to identify and adopt home hardening uh, building code updates and consider adopting guidelines. What we're really looking for is there's national standards that are been developed. We're looking at, can we adopt those by the city on a voluntary basis to get people to really work to harden their homes. These are areas that we would work with a BAB and look at how do the local building codes interface with these. And again, what we need to do is take some of the very simple steps as far as changing bent screen sizes and so forth to make our homes more hardened. Um, next Bob, yeah. this is Gail. I just wondered if you want us to pull up your PowerPoint, uh, just let us know. Yeah, Gail, if you don't mind, go ahead and bring that up. Okay. And as I go by each number, you can change the slides for me if you would. Okay. Thank you. I'll give her a minute to catch up there. It's up. Okay. So we talked about number one, adopting um, home hardening building code updates. Number two is creating messaging bo sign boards at each in the city. This is with a caveat that what we want to do is to provide the most up-to-date information about any incident that's breaking, about evacuations, so that the public, as they're coming and going from town on both ends of the city, can be able to tell um, what's happening. This would be especially important as we deal with visitors to our city who may not know of the AM radio station and other ways to get in contact with us. Number three, utilize the county's um, Ojai Valley CERT function. This is a partnership with the county, with uh, Supervisor LeVere's office, Brian Brennan, uh, we have a lot of people that have gone through the CERT training, but these are volunteers within our community that we should be reaching out to to have them help us um, coordinate operations, be back up to the city functions and so forth, and to be the eyes and ears for us out in the community. Number four, 
continue to grow the city's EOC function and information dissemination. This is something what we have as a partnership with the county EOC and with the fire district and the sheriff's department. And the idea is to look at all options out there to be able to get the most current, reliable, accurate, and true information out to the public. We have found over time that in the absence of giving out current good information, people start spreading rumors and erroneous information gets out. So this would be getting the AM radio station fully operational, make sure you have a plan to staff it, how to get messages to it. Same thing, this would be part of getting the information to the message sign boards. And this is a highly regarded uh, action that the public really looks for city leadership for. Number five, work with the Red Cross and the county OES services to and law enforcement to figure out how to increase the scale, scale and scope of our evacuations through shelters. Ojai is very challenged in that over in the past years, we've had our shelter at Nordoff High School, which is great. And it's a great partnership with the Red Cross and the school district. The problem is, is when we have a fire in the valley, the air quality in the valley uh, de deteriorates and a lot of people need to leave the valley if they can. So we need to have backup options on how to deal with this. Plus we need to look at how, how many people can we accurately hold within the Nordoff. And we should look at options. During the, 20, uh, during the 2017 Thomas fire, the parking lot at Nordoff High School became highly prized with people with RVs, trailers, and so forth as a place to have safe refuge, be away from the fire, get accurate information, and receive help. So evacuation shelters are very much needed. Number six, create a viable risk assessment tool so that the city can work with the insurance companies to work to improve our insurance coverage and provide incentives. This is where we've been working on a pilot risk map to try to figure out, can we really display what the dangers are to the city? Then start meeting with the insurance trade groups to see what the information are they using as they um, take and either insure or issue non-renewals. I myself received a non-renewal notice on my house this year and had to seek alternative insurance coverage. I'm sure many other people in Ojai within the city limits also had to do that. Number seven, conduct public workshops to raise the community awareness and learn how to live with fires. This is something where the fire district has a great program it's called Ready, Set, Go. It teaches people how to prepare, increase their situational awareness of what happens during a wildfire, and then it teaches them when to go when law enforcement shows up at their door in their area. Also with this, we would be looking at asking for some of the insurance trade groups to have a separate um, seminar within the city so that people can really look at, do they have enough coverage and what type of coverage should they have and what happens after a fire? Many of us get insurance coverage when we buy our home and then we may not change it for over 20 years but you have to ask yourself, do I have enough insurance coverage? If I have a devastating loss, can I afford to rebuild? And then the last part on that is uh, conduct tabletop exercises with all participants. Number eight, create an alert process so the public knows how to seek emergency information. I recently was involved in an after action review with another fire in the Southern California area. And one of the biggest things we found is that we have what we call now a digital divide. Many of us watch Netflix, listen to serious radio, watch, read books, but we're not dialed into local news like we used to be. If you ask for how many people actually know how to open up and listen to an AM radio station, you'll find out 
it's not only a digital divide, but it may be a generational divide. So what we need to do is in some areas now, they're looking at coming up with some type of audible sound that the people will know that if you hear this in your community, it's time to tune to a local radio webcast or something to get the latest and greatest of what's happening that you should know about. So number nine, create and implement a regional fuels reduction process and eradication of invasive species in partnership with the fire Ventura and the Ojai Fire Safe Councils. This is something that you could key on into different type of weeds, uh, different type of arundos or the bamboo in the creek beds. We have different fuels around us that are highly flammable that are not native to our area. We need to identify those and look at ways to eradicate those to lessen the degree of fire danger in our area. Number 10, you cert or, or create a cadre of all of volunteers, uh, even if we bring in retirees to um, do voluntary property uh, inspections. This is something that we would be looking for the public is all on a voluntary basis to ask somebody to come in and say, I need some more information on how to harden my home, what to do uh, if a fire approaches. We could also use these volunteers to staff the EOC functions because you know, as a city, you, you don't have a lot of bench depth as far as the number of people that you have in uh, your team. Number 11, have the city's disaster council improve these actions. That was taken care of already is why we're here. Number 12, conduct a community readiness exercise that was done on May 27th. And number 13, evaluate the possibility of the city to hire a contractor to manage these steps or, and partner with the OE, county OES to be able to take all the recommendations and make sure that they're followed through. There's quite a few of the, these actions that will, you've seen some of the costs identified in your attachment on this proposal of the staff report. There are some incurred costs, but I also can tell you there's quite a few grants that they're out there. There was one recent one just issued yesterday by FEMA that may be applicable to help the city institute all of these recommendations. The question is for you to really read that report, what I referenced earlier is the true cost of wildfires. When you read that study, it's a fairly simple read. You can look into, you may not have the money today, or you may have to defer something else. You as a city council have to identify what your priorities are, but understand that the people in Greenville if they were given the opportunity to invest in some of these things, would it have made any difference in their community? We won't know that till um, days later after somebody looks at it. But I just wanna let you know that there are other funding options that may be available to help institute this. In closing, it recognized that what we're encountering right now is a climate change situation where our weather has changed, the number of fires have increased, the timing of our fire season is going in much later in, in the uh, year. So now we have year round fires. And it's the type of thing that in the near future, there isn't any immediate relief that we're seeing. So the best thing that we can do is take our portion, what the city can do, not deal with suppression, not deal with the fuels right now, but deal with what can its citizens receive from the city and what can the city help the citizens do so that we can be more fire safe and be ready for the next wildfire. With that, I'll conclude my presentation and be available for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Bob. So grateful to you. Uh, questions from council? I have a question. Do I ask the 
Okay. Bob, are you still here? Somewhere? I am. Okay. Here's my question, and, and it's possible that you mentioned it and I missed it, but um, do you think that the, the that the general public is aware of alternate evacuation routes? For example, a lot of people seem to think that, uh, you know, people are in the habit of going to Ventura a certain way, but it seems like they should start practicing alternate routes. There's at least five alternate routes out of Ojai, if, if not more. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if um, we should have some kind of, a, uh, I guess I would call it an evacuation map so that people select the closest route to where they live, assuming that it's not, that it's safe to do so. This, is that a clear question? Like, for example, if you live in the river bottom, it doesn't make sense to try to go to Ventura down Maricopa. You would go down, if you live in Miners Oaks, you would take Rice Road or La Luna. And then you could, there's like at least five back roads and there's multiple ways to access Marico uh, the highway to Ventura without going down Maricopa. You know, there's so many different ways and it seems like people should practice that so that if there is a, a, a time sensitive evacuation that they're familiar with the route. Yes, um, I agree with your question and let me just offer this. I agree, I agree that everybody should practice and should understand all the different alternate evacuation routes that are available to them. But the best thing for them to do is before they evacuate is to listen what the city's going to put out, listen to what the county OES is going to put out, and listen to the law enforcement officers that may show up on their street to offer the information. Because they may take an evacuation route unsolicited, and it may be the wrong direction to go. So if they prepare to know all of them, and then when directed to, then they should leave on the most appropriate one so they don't end up going into harm's way. Because sometimes during the course of evacuations, there's a lot of anxiety and we get traffic accidents and it may clog up one of the main routes, which causes us to go to plan B or plan C. So that's where law enforcement, when they do their evacuation directions, they will provide the best information available at the time. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, Bill. Um, again, thank you very much. I um, have learned a lot listening to everybody uh, in terms of participating in a disaster council. And uh, Mr. Roper, I have a. I just want to get your response to my the thought that's I've been pondering more and more, and that is that we are we always face the the fact that among all of the uh, the areas of the county that are divided up by areas of interest and spheres of influence. Ojai is unique in being the smallest proportion of uh, the, uh, the areas of, for which it's uh, the, you know, the only municipal the service area. And I, I'm just wondering your thought on, on, you know, down the road, after we do what we can as a city in a few square miles, 4.2 or something like that, when we're starting to get into, like you say, regional fuel reduction processes, uh, uh, dealing with um, mitigation on, a, on really an area of interest or valley-wide level, at some point we may need to think about a, uh, a district forming a, a uh, open space management district that would include fire mitigation and funded possibly by parcel tax and our uh, sales tax, something that is broad-based because you know, ultimately I'm thinking that the, lead, the city needs to provide some leadership at the, uh, in terms of maybe sponsoring something like that in terms of more efficiently and effectively pursuing these goals. And I just thought I'd throw that out there and get your response to that um, idea. Okay. So here's a, a basic fact that fires don't respect jurisdictional lines. Exactly. Okay. So your point's well taken. And what you have before you tonight is really just what you as a city have control over. But in the dialogue that we've met with Supervisor LeVere, 
is explaining that this is not just a city limit issue, it is a valley-wide issue altogether. So here's an example of what one community did. In the city of uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, they had a severe vegetation issue where it's an urban forest in that town. What they did is they voted in a parcel tax themselves with a sunset clause on it to do exactly what you were talking about doing, taking some of these actions, doing fuel treatments, and they did it because it was something that needed to be done. It passed with over 75% of the vote in favor of that because it was sold and it was advertised and the people understood that unless they do something, step up and do something, uh, it's not gonna get done by itself. So, um, so your point's well taken. And I think when talking with Supervisor LeVere and with other county leaders, as this uh, morphs into a larger plan, there will be needed, but this is truly a regional issue, not just a city issue. Thank you. Any other questions for Bob? Nope. All right, thank you so much, Bob, for zooming in and uh, all your hard work on this. Really grateful to you. And our whole town thanks you. Um, we're going to have a presentation by Chris Danch of the Ojai Fire Council. Please. Mayor, what's he presenting? Do we have a copy of it? Let's switch this damn thing. It's on now. It's on now? Okay. Yeah. I'm actually not presenting anything in terms of a PowerPoint or anything like that, so there's nothing to share with the council at this time. I actually had prepared a, a, a PowerPoint for tonight, and I decided to, uh, after some thought and discussion with many people, including the city manager, that was no, it's not what I wanted to do tonight. So I'm taking, I'm not here to talk about the merits or the not merits of the of the plan that's been proposed there's many elements in there that are that are really good and we actually are working on many of those elements right now through the grant work that we're doing based upon our year almost two years of study and gap analysis of what has to happen not just within the city limits but within the entire area that affects this valley which is roughly the area plan of, uh, under ov mac so i think the thing that has to happen is that much of this, it has to be community driven and community based and community focused. The city obviously has an important leadership role in that and has abilities that only a city has and also only the county has. And you know, there's a of regulatory powers and things like this. And, and of course, the, you know, the leadership role itself. But a lot of this is going to require, is requiring uh, a lot of effort that extends far beyond the city limits and delves into a wide range of relationships and partnerships that have been built up. And you need a community-based organization to work with those, all those different elements. And of course, there is no better or community-based organization in the Ojai Valley than the Ojai Valley Fire Safe Council after 20 plus years of doing this and spending millions of dollars and engaging millions of thousands of hours of people to get this done. Uh, and well, everything that we have talked about to this council and shown presentations to the disaster council, to the, the city council, uh, those who attended the uh, stakeholder event for the grazing program, learned a great deal about that. Uh, everything is based upon this very substantial foundation that has been built for the High Valley Fire Safety Council by its previous leadership. Uh, and so I am going to uh, cut to the chase on this one. It's late in the evening. And that is, is that we would like to propose that the city council direct the city manager to work with the Ojai Valley Fire Safe Council to put together a contract proposal uh, about how we can work with the city. You've already allocated $50,000 that being left where it is, you can rest in, in uh, with assurance that that's going to be well spent. Right now, it's actually set aside as the match for a grant pending on a local CWPP 
or community wildfire protection plan. One thing I did learn in the grant work that I did the last two years is that if you don't have a local CWPP, you can kiss a lot of this any chance of getting this funding goodbye because it's really based on that. So that's now become a focus. Now the roadmap that you've all heard about through prior presentations that I have made is going to make for a very robust local CWPP. And the funding that's being sought right now is really to update the very hazard analysis to a finer degree. That's in addition to the CAL FIRE grant that's pending, we'll know in about the end of August, uh, whether that happens, that dives very deeply into issues of structural hardening, fine scale risk mapping, evacuation assessments uh, that, you know, were identified by our planning work that we did for a year and a half and the gap analysis that we performed. So the idea of this contract is to look to see how can we best work together the city strengths, our strengths as a council, uh, the, the, uh, the depth of the partnerships and relationships we've built. A good example is the grazing program, right? What you see in the grazing program is a tip of an iceberg. Uh, I encourage people, if they would like, I can send them a link when it, when it comes live of a webinar we just gave to the uh, California Range Management Advisory Committee. It was two hours, two hour, one hour presentation, one hour live Q&A. To give you a more of the, the, the depth of that, what that program represents and the, and the brain trust behind it coming from all over the country, quite frankly. Uh, so that's what a community-based organization is well-established and well-experienced brings to the table. So that is my request or proposal for tonight is that you direct the city manager to engage in working with the Y Valley Fire Safety Council to come back to you with a proposal on how we can work together where there is a scope of work, there is deliverables, there's milestones, there's things, there's metrics in there that we can do. And that's the way we can start to approach a very complex matter that's in front of us. And that is all interrelated. You know, hardening goes with, you know, evacuation goes with communications, all these things we have taken a long, hard look at based on years of experience and working with Ventura County Fire Protection District, Ventura County OES. These are all formal collaborators in these things that we're putting out. This isn't something we're doing in isolation. This is where, you know, Pat, we, we have commitments of staff time and resources on these various grants from these various organizations. So these are, these are things that have a lot of effort have gone into. But we working together can do a whole lot more than we can working apart. So that's what I would ask of the council is to uh, take the direction of having a formal proposal prepared and we'll see where it goes from there. And I'm open to any questions, obviously. Um, Chris, are there any examples, and this kind of gets back to my previous point of how small we are compared to the old Pole Valley. Are there any examples of where uh, fire safe councils are funded by contract, both by municipalities and the uh, county unincorporated areas surrounding them? You know, is the county and the city working together to fund fire safe council activities? Does that happen anywhere? Any example of that? I have not seen any examples of that. I have seen consortiums like we formed for the CAL FIRE grant right. uh, that combines both public agencies and and, and fire safe councils and RCDs for that matter. Right. So we've seen that. Um, I haven't actually seen the, the contract uh, situation, though I don't know if it, I can't say it doesn't exist. I just don't know of right. any like that. Uh, you think our, Mr. Levere's office would be receptive to that discussion? Yes, I do believe they'd be receptive to that. I've had discussions with Matt Levere and with Brian and other people right. and OB Mac and uh, what Bob talked about, you know, something I have proposed almost a year ago now is the idea of the parcel tax. And, and our idea there is because the concerns of the valley extend beyond the city limits, particularly in the Ember cast and all these types of considerations, that we take something, we can take Flagstaff's example, we can take Marin's example. There's two passed overwhelmingly last year and raised $19 million for the wildfire effort. Now, they, they did something different because it was countywide. It's a much smaller county, much less diverse, uh, both in demographics and in topography. Uh, so that model is not necessarily applicable. It's a joint powers agreement between cities and townships. 
Uh, what I have suggested and have discussed with OV Mac and with uh, council, with the, uh, Supervisor Levere and others is to form a, a community wildfire protection district. That is this. That is the S, the, the baseline for this community focused, community driven risk mitigation strategy that we have been we have proposed and have been pursuing vigorously. So that is in looking at this contract and not to. Uh, you know, forecast anything that we that's going to be proposed, but a lot of the stuff is grant driven. For example, the vegetation thing actually, as we discussed at the uh, at the uh, building appeals board last night, that funding is actually becoming more difficult to get, even though it, the talk it's out there. But for people located in the Chaparral Wooey, it's not quite the same. And if you ever go through a Cal Fire application, you can see the bias in there about where they want to go, and. Uh, and structural hardening is a complicated long-term process to deal with to make it of a consistency and scale required to make a difference. And I'm sorry to say that voluntary compliance has never proven to be enough uh, to do that. It's like you harden your house and people next door don't and your place burns down because there's catches on fire first. So it's a very complex matter. It's all tied to insurance, insurance incentives, regulatory matters. Uh, I've been involved for two years in an insurance work group uh, that's in the state, including the insurance commissioner sitting there, uh, or I mean, the deputy. And, you know, these, this is, it's, a, it's a deep dive to try to get into that and try to find, there are, there are home certification programs that in certain communities that in, uh, one or more insurers is bought into. It's a long process to get them there. For example, in our Cal Fire grant, if we get that, uh, we'll pursue other funding for that, but that's what's in front of us right now. And that's almost a million dollars of Ojai specific matters uh, in that grant. Um, Chris, is, Chris, right here. Chris. What's that? Right here. Mayor, um, you've given us- I could go on and on, obviously. I'm sorry. That's, that's, that's why I'm um, willing to say I, I enjoy the thought of bringing you um, into the discussion further um, and I think when we start deliberating, that might be something that we look at, um, but we got to get to that point of deliberating. So thank you for your input. Again, every time you speak, we learn. Um, I do have um, a question though. Okay. Chris, um, have you run your request by Bob Roper? This well, we've shared the, the roadmap. Uh, the, the, I didn't actually, you know, we, I had this thought last year, this is where I wanted to go, but you know, we, we lost a year and it's been a recovery from, from, the, from that to even begin to have a discussion. And certainly why the city was in, you know, I know it's not recovered, but it was in dire straits. And there's no use having that kind of discussion at that point. So I have not run it by anybody, except I've made it public in, in what I would like to do uh, and what the Fire Safe Council would like to do. So, uh, but right now, you know, in order for you guys to deliberate, you need to, I think you need to have a formal proposal in front of you. And that's something that has to be jointly developed because it's how we work together that make, that's gonna make the difference. Okay, thank you. Does that make um, sense? Yes, okay, thanks. Thank um, Gail, any public comments on this on Zoom? None on Zoom. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, thank Chris. you. All right, ready for discussion? Go ahead, Brady. Well, so, so Mayor, I think this, the, the report is, is, um, is excellent. I think there's a lot of information being provided. I see a lot of redundancies in it. Um, it seems like the city manager would be doing or is already doing. Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we take this report back instead of going line by line right now. Um, maybe we review it individually and then submit it back to the city manager and then we put this back on the agenda for further discussion um this evaluating a position or a, to hire a contractor i think that's specifically what chris is talking to seems like he has an expertise into it seems like the city manager needs to investigate that a little further um you brought up bob roper who's um obviously brings a lot to the table with his expertise but again he's an advisor to us so again, having a little more input with him, maybe having him and Chris and the city manager in the same room to flush this out a little deeper would be beneficial. I think, um, again, what Chris said about hardening our buildings, I think that's something that we need to direct Bab to and Bab just needs to accept the responsibility of it. No matter what they think um, or believe the community will do, 
give us their best advice and or their best opinion and let council debate on that. But there's a lot of this I, that, that I um, like, and there's a lot of it that I see as redundant. And um, again, to me, the, the, the biggest concern I have in most of this is we're always footing the bill and that we don't have a mechanism in here um, how to involve the county or even outside agencies. We don't have a grant, a grant writer with the city, which we've been pushing for for years, but we don't have one. So again, those are things that I think have to be fleshed out before we take this um, any further. That's my suggestion. I just want to reiterate what Bob said, he, and we spoke uh, Sunday about this, and he, he assured me that there's a lot of grant money out there. He's pursuing some different options. And James and I did have a conversation about the funding and where it would come from. And Well, like I said, this is the city council and there's five of us. So we need to be included in as much information as there is out there. And I appreciate your efforts, but we need that information so that the five of us can move this forward together. Right. Well, we're looking at $200,000 right now, $100,000 for the messaging, uh, $50,000 for the alert, $50,000 for the contractor, and $2,000 for the workshop. So that's $202,000. And, and again, I don't think there's anyone on the council right now that would say no to it if we had it. We don't have it. So how can we figure out how to, um, how to get it? James, do you have any insight at this point? Uh, as far as the, uh, well, so we, we came up with those cost estimates. I think those are fairly realistic. Um, the, uh, we had identified in the staff report that if the city council were to adopt it, that we would recommend coming back with a funding plan that would identify, uh, where that funding would come from and, and, um, and then some more detail on what exactly those costs are. But, um, so that's something we could do. Uh, we could either look at if the plan is uh, adopted or uh, if we can bring that back with more information if that's requested by council. So. And, and is it, and James, in terms of the contractor, mm -hmm. um, would you prefer to hire a contractor or would you prefer to hire a staff member and that would be per, part of the person's job? Yeah, so um, we, uh, I know we talked about at Disaster Council, those options. I don't uh, think that our city has uh, enough uh, tasks related to this to have a full-time staff person. I think it wouldn't be a wise use of our, our funding, uh, uh, limited funds to do that. So um, uh, we, uh, I would suggest if we were to, to choose one of those, it would be a contractor. So. So we're being asked to adopt, consider uh, adoption. Adopting, yeah. The draft or comments? Go I'm trying to follow this. Uh, Councilperson Haney, I think that what I'm hearing from you is you're fine with this in principle, but want to further vet it in terms of funding support? Yes. Possibilities? Yeah, that and, and let's get let's get the players who, who uh, I know they're part of um, the mayors and your the council that you two, the resiliency council that you two are on. Um, so you two are privileged to a lot of information that the other three of us aren't. The disaster council. Right, and that's what I'm trying to say is we need more of that information that will help us understand the foundation of these 13 requests. That's all I'm asking for. You know, I noticed that the recommendation is to consider adoption of the draft Ojai Wildlife Resiliency yeah, Plan, yeah. which is really what you're saying is that we uh, maybe we have a uh, make a motion that we adopt the uh, the principle in principle the draft Ojai Wildlife Resiliency Plan, subject to further uh, vetting and uh, and funding uh, possibilities. Yeah, I th you know, I, I think that's a good start, and I also think that we need to right off the bat send. Uh, the um, the adopt a home hardening and building code updates and consider adopting some guidelines. I think we don't need to wait um, for staff to come back. I think we can direct staff to uh, to communicate to the building appeals board to start on it. We met last night and they they cultivated a list and so they are meeting. I believe in two more two weeks to yeah, finalize they, that. The idea I think it was to come back in early September to finalize it. So yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we have a motion. 
Uh, I, I'll, I'll I have a comment. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I, I have a few comments. Um, first of all, we've got to stop. We can't just imagine that the only disaster that's going to happen is fire. Like, this is called the disaster council. This is about fire, 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 fire. We're all going to end up putting all our eggs in one basket and have an earthquake. We've got to remember that emergency preparedness is not about one particular type of disaster. It just happens to be the one that's most acute and probably the most probable, but by far not the only one that's likely. So I'm, I'm, I just want to make sure that as we allocate resources and move forward with this, and I appreciate Chris's work and I appreciate Mr. Roper's work, but that's not the only disaster that we could face. And if we end up with that not being the disaster we're facing and where we spend our resources, we're going to look back and go, wow, that was pretty stupid to think that that was the only thing that could happen. Uh, inside of these 13 points, which are very lengthy, uh, there's nothing about the fire hydrant system. The single biggest factor that I believe, you know, I'm not an expert, but if you look at where the map is on the Thomas fire, it goes right around where the fire hydrants were. I personally, along with my colleagues at Ojai Flow, held Golden State Water accountable for their hydrant system. We need to hold Casitas accountable for the same hydrant system. If we don't know the fire hydrants are working with the appropriate pressure, then all these other things are so minuscule in comparison to having a fully operational, fully functional at its peak quality hydrant system for the preservation of the city if we're worried about a serious like extermination of the city event. It may not protect us from all of the outside areas outside the city, but the last time I checked, this council can only control what happens inside the city limits. Of course, we wanna work with the county and other things, but as far as our hydrant system, it is imperative as it extends to the borders of our city that we keep it in tip top shape and hold the agencies that are responsible for it accountable. Additionally, I don't see any need whatsoever for a contractor. The problem with the contractor is maybe we roll the dice and get lucky at the time of an emergency, but if that contractor isn't physically here, then we have procured someone to help us assist in a situation where we can't even reasonably ask them to be present. When we talk about our staff members, specifically James, who was not necessarily tasked with that, but did show up and was one of the few people in the city staff and in all the city apparatus that showed up during the Thomas fire, that it's imperative. I think we have somebody that's internal that is the lead person for this, whether it's James or someone else, it's gotta be someone who we know physically where they live and how close they are to be able to take care of this because there may not be an opportunity to get somebody from outside of town. I know this because I litigated the issue of nobody from Golden State Water being present within 250 miles of Ojai during multiple different disasters that caused hours of delay and were significant problems. So I just wanna make sure we look at that. As far as someone bringing up sales tax as a way to raise money to do this, I am against any sales tax increase in the city of Ojai now or ever, unless there is something that compels me so overwhelmingly that disproportionately affects the people that live in the city. It hurts us from the cost of living standpoint. It won't derive nearly as much income as people think. We don't have big box stores. We don't have car dealerships. We don't have any of the elements that drive a tax, a sales tax increase to increase things. If we want to find another way to fund this, I'm all for it. Whether it's a parcel tax that extends outside the city or increase in the TOT again to add another percent or two to be able to allocate money for this. I much prefer considering that only as a last resort if it's absolutely necessary. And I got to tell you, this is not where we're at yet. I do not support any type of sales tax increase. The message board system, well, I think it could be viable for a lot of different reasons. It's an expensive price tag, but in an emergency, I don't really see how having message boards at locations throughout the city where you have to drive there to physically see when you need the information before you get in your car makes a ton of sense. There's so much more technology between push notifications for text messages to social media to other assets. I don't know if message boards are the most efficient way to be able to get information in an emergency. I can tell you that if I have an emergency and I have to decide when and how and what to do, I can't imagine physically seeing a message board along a road as being the most important element to figuring out what to do. Because by the time you get there, you might already be in the wrong place. And then lastly, I'm going to keep bringing this up, James, until you get it done. Having one emergency day is not enough. We need an emergency preparedness week. We need multiple different types of emergencies we're talking about. I have no problem with it being 
the last week in May, you know, right before June starts when we had it at May 27th this year, but it came, it went, I believe we need a whole week. It should be something that we really hype up that we're making sure the public schools are talking about. That includes how to be safe in a, in a, in a, in an earthquake, heaven forbid we get a flood. If we ever get that much water, maybe we'll be trying to get a flood at some point, but if it's not a good flood, all of the different types of disasters that can happen. Again, we need to remember that if we focus only on one, we're going to end up looking one way and getting hit in the back of the head by another. Um, this, this is something that interestingly, I think we have the most galvanized and, and kind of unequivocal support from our community, from our council, from everywhere around that these are things that we should do. And these are things that good government should do, trying to make us more safe in an emergency and trying to make sure that we're educated and we're communicating and we have all those pieces in place. But the reality also is that fires are incredibly scary when you watch them on the news and they're incredibly scary about ripping through the entire city, but they generally don't usually not provide enough time to get to a safe location. So I want to make sure we focus on some level of protecting people in the short term to live through the fire. And then we have evacuation centers where that's where you go in the longer term. If for instance, your house burns down, but if you are in the East end of Ohio and you got to get to Nordoff and the people from Oakview also have to get to Nordoff and the people from Miners Oaks have to get to Nordoff and everybody's competing to get to one spot. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I personally, everybody on the staff already knows this. I've told all them, but I personally opened up Soul Park golf course during the last, during the Thomas fire. Um, I, I think we've got to incorporate more what I call bug in positions versus bug out positions to make sure we have safe locations that people can hunker down under a situation where if there is a massive firestorm or other emergency where it's acute and you need to be safe with other types of longer term emergency facilities for if you lose your home or you need to spend more time there, you need a cot, you need to sleep, you need to eat there. Those are different than just a short term evacuation. And nothing in here accounts for these specific issues. Uh, I'll just say the first thing I did when I got on this council was request a meeting with the Ohio, uh, the uh, 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 Office of Emergency Services with the county. James Vega and I sat down with Mr. Maynard, who's now the, the who runs it. And it was a very productive, very good conversation. But some of the things that we discussed in that first meeting, as comprehensive as this is, are missing from this. So I want to make sure that that, you know, I'm going to keep pounding the table and making sure these ideas are there. But without a fire hydrant system, these other ideas are, are minuscule compared to that. Without a place where people can get to safely, having an evacuation center isn't as important because they got to be able to hunker down if the fire is overwhelming or coming through our tiny little city. And then we don't have to worry about traffic as much. We don't have to worry about people not being able to get out of town. For example, the, the gas station at Chevron was completely locked up in the Thomas fire. I've asked that we had a gas rationing program to be able to limit how much gas people could get in that moment and be able to get out of town. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that, but these things are not included in here that are part of what I think is much more important. And the idea that we're going to pay for this with the sales tax is not okay with me at all. So I want to make sure that's out there. I think this is a good start. I think we need a robust discussion on this. I think we have a lot of support for everybody agreeing we need to do stuff with this, but I think this is a long way from being a finalized product that really is as efficient and is as uh, well put together as we need for a community that has the high risks we do. So, oh, Mayor, um, this is why I said, let's all take it home <laughs> and add our two cents to it and bring it back because obviously Ryan had a lot to say and a lot of it makes sense, Ryan. A lot of it makes sense. Um, so maybe we don't need a motion other than we just table this. We all bring back what we want to it. And um, we have time, James. We have an, uh, we have, uh, an opening at the next uh, council session to do that. Because after listening to all the things that Ryan said, I'm sure we all have a little more well, information we'd like to What about to we uh, adopt this and then add to it? You know, if it's mostly there and you, you, know, you brought up some really good points, Ryan, we can continue you know we do have the, the chair of the california fire safe council 
drafting this. So, I mean, there's a lot of great, great material there. And he's the retired county chief. So I feel like we can all trust that. Let me finish my sentence, please. We can all trust that we're on the right, right track. And of course, it's a work in progress. So uh, I would advocate that we. Well, I don't know what we're adopting there. That's the problem. Uh, after listening to each one of us speak, we all have more to add to this. So we're adopting something that um, well, we can doesn't necessarily at this moment need to be adopted. That's, I guess, what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying that the work isn't great, and I'm not saying that we're grateful for the time and effort. But at this point, it just seems like there's a lot more that we can add to this to make it better than what it is in this moment. And um, maybe even take it back to your council and let you guys digest some of the notes that you're going to receive from us. And so. Well, is Bob so, Roper listening to this discussion? And if he isn't, let's ask him to. Are you still here, Bob? Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to make, Mayor, if I can, I'm going to make a motion. Oh, there he is. That's, nope. Second. No. No. Never mind. Mine died for last week. Second. Yeah. Go ahead, Randy. So I'm going to make a motion that we table this and that we bring it back and that each council member add to this list and um, send it to James and then have James compile it and forward it to us in preparation for the next council meeting. Would you yeah. consider modifying that as a friendly amendment to continue to a uh, time certain rather than rather than tabling? That we continue to a time certain. Uh, yeah, I'd go as far, Bill, as say we should do this at the next meeting. I mean, yeah. I don't get me wrong. I think this is yeah. as important and as supported and as imperative as anything we do. I, I would be, uh, you know, barring uh, James saying two, you know, a two week turn, turnaround time is is too quick. Which I'll defer to him. But I would not only a time certain. I'd say as soon as possible. Right. Um, and I, and I do appreciate all the work here. I think it's, there, there was, a, I mean, when I, when I came into office, I asked, uh, I asked uh, Mr. McClary for a meeting with Office of Emergency Services. He didn't provide, as soon as James got into office, within a week, we sat down and had a meeting. And it, it was clear to me that the lessons learned in the Thomas fire were not communicated back to the county. And the county was not adopting some of those things, whether they weren't listening, whether we weren't telling them, whether there was some lack of cooperation was unbelievably disturbing to me. So I really appreciate this kicking the door open and saying, we're going to get something done. Mayor, I really appreciate the work. You, Mr. Roper, Mr. Daddy, everyone else. I don't mean to skip anybody. I know there's a lot to this, um, but there are very specific things we learned because we lived through them, not because we are talking about it on paper, what we think is important. And, I don't want to approve anything until those things are included. So, so that's I think why, let's bring it back as soon as possible. How about we continue to the next meeting? We bring, uh, we incorporate all council comments and then we decide what to do from there. I'd say we keep bringing this back at every meeting until it's done. That's what uh, yeah, I'm saying. I agree with that. So August 24th, we can bring it back. Yeah, we can, we can get it back by August 24th. Uh, I would just say that means we'd have to have comments by the end of the week. To, to print it next week. Andy, are you, some, are you some of them you received that? tonight. Yeah, I'm in agreement. Some of you just got Okay. So. I just need a second. I'll second the amended motion. So, Ryan, you can print, write down all the comments. I'm sorry, Susie, I couldn't hear you. Oh. you. You can do this by the end of the week. Write down all your comments. Yeah, well, I, I think his comments. I don't. I, in fact, I don't think I said anything here. James didn't already know, but I will make sure that uh, whatever whatever deadline he sets for me to have any comments he needs from me, I will make sure it happens. And they're all on video too. Also. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is no way. This is not being recorded. Um, okay, wait. We have a roll call, please, Gail. Mayor Pro Tem Wyrick. Yes. Mayor Stix. Yes. Councilmember Francina. Yes. Councilmember Haney? Yes. Councilmember Blatz? Yes. Great. Excellent. And thank you all. For thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roper, too, if you're, yes. if you're still there. Thank you. And thank else. you, Chris and Wayne. And Chris. Wayne. And of course, really uh, see, Chris. Thank you, as always. Uh, 
time is it? It's 1015. Can we move on to the general plan? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, this will be this is item number six. Yes. Uh, the general plan update vision and guiding principles statement. Um, staff report. Thank you. Uh, so we'll try to keep this um, fairly brief. Uh, we can get into more detail if uh, desired, but I know it's getting late. So uh, we, uh, as part of the general plan update, we've had a series of workshops and uh, we took some of the feedback from those workshops and we developed some vision and guiding principles. Uh, th this is important because it helps guide the remainder of the general plan update. These are the principles by which we kind of structure the rest of the update around. Uh, the uh, Following all the uh, workshops that we had, we worked with the planning commission on kind of fine tuning those statements. We then brought the uh, statement uh, our vision and guiding principles to city council a uh, couple months back. The city council uh, asked to um, get some time to give some feedback and some comments on the statement. So we have, uh, we over the um, summer recess, we prepared an updated uh, version that incorporated the comments from that we received from council members. So that updated version is attached and we are recommending that the city council review it, provide any feedback and then adopt it uh, so that uh, we will then have the completed vision and guiding principles statement that will allow us to continue the general plan update. So uh, with that, uh, if there's any specific questions, uh, both um, the community development director uh, and I are available to answer those. So. My question is, I didn't find, um, I didn't find a statement that was, that made sense. I mean, it, it wasn't, if you're, I was looking for a statement that was, um, you know, complete. And, and I mean, if you look at the one at the top, the community vision, so it the, the sentences didn't don't make sense they're not um they, sh they should we what we did was we reflected the changes uh so we had brought this to council previously we received feedback from uh individual council members yeah. so the track changes are on the document so the um different colors uh reflect kind of changes from different uh, council members, but they're all incorporated into the statement. Uh, the strike through reflects the items that have been removed. So it should make sense. Um, yeah, but it, does, it doesn't. If you read it out loud without the strike throughs, you don't have a complete statement. It's a sentence. It's, it's a sentence, am I correct? Or is it a statement? Yeah, is there is there a particular? Well, maybe we should just read it and then we can pause if it doesn't make sense. Okay. This is this is the final, right? At the top of the page, the final draft. The one, the attachment A in the packet. So like uh, community vision, uh, it says the community vision summarizes what the community aspires to be in the future. It describes the community's desired character and conditions in the year 2045. What was added is the, the statement, the Ojai Valley is an internationally recognized community of cultural, artistic, health, and spiritual significance. Surrounded by majestic mountains, open space, and regenerative agriculture, the city of Ojai is an eclectic and diverse small town whose unique character is reflected in its vibrant downtown historic architecture, friendly neighborhoods, and abundant natural beauty. So it, it should make sense. Kind yeah, of. so far, so good. Okay. Its residents are a mosaic of people of all ages, backgrounds, perspectives, and income levels who respect and celebrate one another's differences and culturally support equal access to services and opportunity. Together, they take pride 
from embracing the broad principles of sustainability expressed through conservation and restoration of natural and community ecological health inclusive of aggressively addressing endemic environmental challenges such as, such as climate change. The community's dedicated support for small locally owned businesses and housing uh, oh, housing their owners and employees also aspire to support an Ojai Valley economy that prioritizes overall human and ecological needs above all else. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. What more would you like? Any other questions for Steph? Are we going to go through every paragraph in this? No, no, no. James's okay. resume said he could um, read. That was impressive. I I'm fine with it. I wasn't sure what was meant by cultural please support equal access but if everyone under else understands it it sounds good does it make sense this does what was read make sense to my colleagues all of it um, i'll say yes okay. I, I think the idea i remember i remember we had comments on this was i think the term equitable uh, there were concerns with and so Instead, we had said, instead of enjoying equitable access, we said, you know, the intention is to say our culture is to support equal access. That's to, to services and opportunity. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, we have one public comment on this, Steve Colomay. Thanks for hanging in there, Steve. Here he comes. Yeah. And so my mistake, the sentences were complete. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, but I think you it's guys worth really reading. Really, the ones that have been hanging in. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you, and, and and I'm afraid I'm going to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer in terms of where this document is, and I I agree with Councilmember Sousa that it simply doesn't read well. Um, mm -hmm. But before I go into that, I want to say first that the U.S. West is currently the driest it's been since 1580. And that's according to climate and fire uh, scientist at UCLA Park Williams. That's in the last five, four and a half centuries. And it puts an exclamation point on uh, the excellent statement of Chief Roper. Uh, and it's really wonderful that we have that kind of expertise uh, that's giving us guidance. And anyone who's seen the news in the last couple of days realizes that uh, the UN has released its report, Climate Change in 2021, the physical and science basis. Well, the story is not very optimistic. Um, it's the first update in eight years, and it's the most um, dramatic in terms of its projections. Changes are accelerating and will simply be getting worse. Weather will not only be more extreme, but we may experience multiple climate disasters all at once. And, and uh, 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 Council Member Blatt's teed this up. We in the Ojai Valley are at risk not only of wildfire, but drought, extreme heat events, which for those who are, uh, don't have air conditioning and are seniors in this community is a serious risk, a risk of mortality. And ironically, floods. We're right, a, a potential target for an atmospheric river coming in off the Pacific as a consequence of climate change. This is happening faster than our models had predicted less than a decade ago. Uh, and there's still, however, the report indicates is a narrow window of opportunity to prevent more extreme outcomes. But that window is narrowing and incremental actions are simply not gonna cut it. Um, extreme risks that we face um, warrant ex aggressive public um, policy. And the main take home of the report is that fossil fuel use and production needs to be decreased rapidly. We don't have the time to, to, to waste. We, it, re it requires um, aggressive action, both locally and globally. So that gets us to the vision and um, guiding principle statement of the general plan. And let me remind you that this statement which is right now is in a very rough condition, is gonna be with us to 2045. This is gonna reflect this community, what its vision is for the world that we will inhabit in 2045. It's gonna be very different then. Um, so during the early public meetings, it was clear that the 
residents of Ojai, am time. I going to get cut off? That's time. Oh. You can grant, grant them time. Bishop? Yeah. Mayor, I, re I request, because this is so important, that we do give him time to finish. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, can you finish in a minute, Steve? Well, I, I, um, I think just so I'm going to. So I think the it, it was quite clear in early discussions that the residents of Ojai were very concerned about climate mitigation and adaptation, uh, including wildfires, extreme heat and drought. So let's consider the current version that you're looking at and the modifications that were made. The blue line version of the community vision is far more convoluted and less meaningful than the more straightforward planning commission version. I recommend that you delete all blue line comments and start your edit edits from there. For example, environmental challenges should never be labeled endemic. It's the wrong choice of words. The guiding principles for climate change should be moved forward to reflect the priorities of this community. And it should not be the last, pr the last uh, principle. The title should remain climate change mitigation environmental change mitigation is wrong and meaningless as there are environmental changes that we would embrace and enhance rather than mitigate. For example, rainwater retention, further improvements of air quality. And I see that um, this largely came from a, the, the uh, memo of a single council member and, um, and it hasn't been vetted. I had to go back three months to both uh, planning commission and uh, council meetings in March or in May uh, to find the provenance of this. And I just think it's, um, having been an editor of, of technical scientific journals, I think this is a muddled mess. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Gail, any comments on Zoom? No Zoom commenters. Okay, thank you. All right. Discussion? Yeah, I'm glad that the uh, comments of uh, the two council people that wrote their um, suggestions were included. And um, I also have, you know, had a lot of experience in writing these kinds of things. And um, I think it's important to be precise and visionary over the time period involved, 2045. And um, again, uh, it's no secret that I think sometimes Mr. Colome has a narrow advocacy view, and I think we need a broader view in this statement. I'm gonna thank Steve for his comments. I mean, he's, he's a smart guy, but um, what I heard was doom and gloom, and um, and that's not what this is about. This is a broad statement of what the vision of the community will look like in 2045, what we respect, what we see, what we are, who we are. Um, so when we get to climate environment or climate challenges or climate, I hear what Steve is saying, and, I am, and we might reinforce that statement. I'm not... Um, necessarily sure where it belongs in the categories at the top at the bottom or in the middle again i don't uh what steve is saying is needs to be at the top because be, because climate change is the most important thing facing us as a community so again i don't necessarily disagree with those statements but the opening statement um i find reads well and is well um and each specific statement here of our guiding principles are what we aspire to be and, 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 and expect to be in 2045. Um, and I don't know if we want gloom and doom in our general plan. Um, it's a part of what we are. It's something that we're going to have to adjust ourselves to live with and uh, mitigate. But... Um, I think I, I could live with what's presented here tonight. I don't have any, any major changes to, to make. Um, James, how important is it this be finalized tonight? It's, it's a big uh, step in the process to get the general plan update moving forward. We have kind of uh, 
uh, not paused, but it hasn't been able to move as quickly over the last couple of months uh, as we were waiting for this to, to do a couple of things. So um, it, it would be a positive step forward to move this forward. Mayor, uh, here here is what I uh, suggest. Um, you know, the I, I do want to see the statements, the headings say climate change mitigation. I, I'm not in favor of changing um, in climate to the word environmental. It's a different, um, it's, you know, it needs to say climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience. And then we could incorporate, we all received a copy from um, Phil White. I think we could um, copy um, the county's guiding principles for climate. It's very concise. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions to work towards achieving all adopted targets. Proactively anticipate and mitigate the impacts of climate change. Promote employment opportunities and renewable energy and reducing greenhouse, excuse me, gases and increase resilience to the effects of climate change. And whether that should go last or first, it can't be mixed in the middle. If it works to put it first, I'd be fine with that. If not, well, sorry. <laughs> if it goes at the, at the last, doesn't mean um, that it's last, but just for reading purposes. Mayor Sticks, <clears throat> if I could respond. <coughs> Are you, I'm, I didn't want to interrupt you. So. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I, I think it's very good. important to look at the distinguishing point. The reason I think environmental is important rather than climate is it's broader. Climate is narrower than environmental. Environmental includes things that we do that are not you know, locally in our community to, that are uh, deleterious to our environment. In other words, it's climate plus. And therefore, I think that um, uh, the things that, that uh, we do in terms of managing our, our valley and our, our local environment are um, as important, frankly, as uh, the, the overall uh, global climate issues. We both, we have our re responsibility for uh, our part, but we, in terms of the, uh, the climate issues globally, we also have a, an important part to think about our local environment and our immediate impacts on terms of how we, we manage things like um, our, um, uh, in the face of climate change, our local water, our, our local uh, uh, fauna, uh, how we handle our agricultural sector, uh, how we handle uh, our our overall uh, uh, climate, our overall uh, community character. So again, I think that um, the word environmental is a broader, inclusive, and not narrowly focused. And I just think it's uh, it, this is an important philosophical debate to have. Um, I don't think that it belongs at the beginning because the beginning is the uh, community vision, vision. I think in terms of reordering uh, guiding principles, uh, you know, I, I think that's-, that's Mr. Open. Weirich, can that's I just recommend discussion. something? Huh? Well, I, I, just, I just think, I, I, how about environmental and climate change mitigation? I have no problem with that. I, I just want to recommend that before we get too deep in the- Yeah. I, I or climate the, and the, the weeds I, growing up around I, us. I didn't mean first, before the community vision, I meant the first after community vision. Right. Well, and then but, but, it, it, the first one. Points, just, let's make it. Let's just make it inclusive. And I want to point principles. out that the word environmental appears twice in in the current statement. So you're saying? Yeah, actually, that was from the planning commission environmental stewardship, and uh, I think that. Um, yeah, that, and I, I understand. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not hung up on the ordering. Frankly, I think under guiding principles, small town character ought to be first uh, with some of these other ones. Um, and I have no problems with perhaps combining uh, or having environmental stewardship and, uh, and environmental change, climate, environmental and climate change mitigation, perhaps find a way to combining the two. No, I think, I think the world is burning. I think the hour is late. I think that we need a separate, a, the separate category. I, I'd agree with you, Susan. We got to get it in there. Yeah. Um, Pardon me. So we're breaking it out now. 
That's what I just heard. Well, again, I, I think that it's it's the uh, climate is part of the environment. Well, and we could use what Susa just read Jeez. from the county. No, I don't want to just replicate county. Well, we can put it in our own words, but it's yeah. pretty well said. Um, yeah, I think we need to get um, climate back in there, mitigation and policy. Well, we did, climate was never eliminated. Uh, you notice what was suggested here was devise robust strategies to mitigate and adapt environmental hazards, including those associated with climate change, including wildfires, extreme heat, flooding, and drought. Well, so we can go with Ryan's suggestion, have both? That's what I, I thought was good. Okay. Um, one other, um, the word visitation. What? The word visitation. I would, mm -hmm. I would return it. Uh, to tourism. It's, it's, they took out tourism and put in visitation. visitation. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. 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 Visitation to me <laughs> seems like. We're, we're discouraging our uh, extraterrestrial neighbors from coming. Well, if or no visitation. It's usually when you visit a, a dead body. Wait, but, well, Mayor, before we go. <laughs> Balance the economy, we Randy. Visitation, third, let's third finish line, climate. Okay. Yeah. Or, so that's what we're doing. We're just going to add climate back into climate slash environmental change mitigation. I think yeah. climate and environmental was what Ryan said. Okay. Yeah, and if you if we can include it in the we can well that's the way the title is already written environmental and or just say environmental or excuse me sorry it's not climate and environmental change or environmental and climate change mitigation and then if we wanted to add environmental in front of the second line where it says with climate change you could say with environmental and climate change so we're covering both bases to appease everyone's semantic I'm fine with that desires well. It has adaption of environmental hazards, including those associated with climate change. Right, but it could say environmental and climate change, which to our colleagues is very important. Let's do it. All right. I think I, I don't think it's going overboard to say both. Got it, James. And then on maintain a viable visitation industry, I did just think that sounded funny. Is that what you were talking about, Mayor? Yeah, I'll explain my thought. Um, I think there's a difference between visitation where people are participating in our community versus the kind of, uh, you know, come and gawk or lick and click tourism. Oh, yeah, I understand. What and, you mean. Uh, so I was trying to capture that probably awkwardly, but nevertheless, I think what we want to encourage is a, uh, is people participating in our community oh, as visitors. The economy uh, third line down. Not, do you know, where, where section is that in the visitation? Under balanced economy. Balanced economy. Balanced economy. So next to the last one. Okay. And it's the third line down right after the first word, maintain a viable visitation industry. And so I was just trying to get at the difference in my mind uh, with that suggestion between. Uh, <laughs> you didn't want to use transient visitation. industry? You didn't huh? want to use transient industry? What? You didn't want to use transient industry? <laughs> well, uh, to me, there's a difference between just people coming in. Um, I, you know, I think it's, a, let's put it this way. Uh, I, I, I like people making a, a point of trying to, you know, come here every year for our music festival or the tennis tournament. If we How about maintain Ojai as a viable destination for visitors that like emphasizes that. Ojai's educational opportunities. I like that. Okay. Maintain James, are you listening to me somewhere over there? Got it. Maintains Ojai as a viable destination for visitors. That emphasizes OHI's educational opportunities. I like that. Thank you. That's better. Yeah. One other, I'm not finding it right. It's, it's, um, Bill, you suggested you adding um, communities unwavering support for small locally owned businesses and housing their owners and employees. I think that's a, a tricky statement. Okay. Um, about housing people. Where are we now? I can't find it right now. It's under yeah, that's, that's uh, a, community a, vision. Community, community vision. Okay. Yeah, I had trouble with all that. That's why I asked if the rest of you had trouble okay. with it. Which one now were the... Uh, so the last sentence on the first section. Oh, the yeah. The communities dedicated... Or for, for small, small locally owned businesses and... Uh, uh, and housing. And housing. And maybe it should say providing housing for their owners and employees. Yeah. You don't have to even say no. owners and employees. Because I think the vision is more about 
everybody, including okay. the, the planet, the trees. The you think maybe just delete? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or it could say, and providing housing for all local workers. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do think it's important that we are as semantically driven an exercise as this is, and I've never heard any of my colleagues go back to the visioning statement from the last general plan to decide anything they've ever done. But that being said, we do have some fundamental things that are a big deal. And one of them is the longest average commute of any city in the community. That's what so I, I think, was trying to get at. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's an important that's thing. That's what I was trying on. to get yeah. at is to have promote people being able to live and work yeah. there rather than have, you know, I, I completely understand it. I think it, I think, you know, syntax wise, maybe just uh, yeah. providing housing for our local workers might be okay. Because I, I'm with, I understand what uh, Mayor Sticks is saying. Housing their owners and employees almost seems exclusionary rather than I, I, you're, yeah, it's uh, inartful. Well, yeah. it seems a, an open door to right idea. development. So I just wanted to put that out there. I would agree. Just remember, we're still going to be alive in 2045. Yeah. Um, do we have a motion? Well, I, I have a motion to adopt it as with all the modifications we just mentioned. I'll second that. All right, beautiful. Um, what, did, what did you just say? I'm sorry I had to leave for a moment. I'm freezing to death, by the way, but I don't know how to turn up that fan off. We made changes. Yeah. Well, are but you, what happened to are you this? Good all the amendments oh, we made? All right. Okay. Yeah. We'll play back the tape. <laughs> all right. You too. All right. Me, we have the roll call, please, Gail. Mayor Sticks. Thank you. Yes. Councilmember Haney. Why not? Councilmember Blatz. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Wyrick. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. Councilmember Francina. Yes. All right. And thank you all for collaborating on this, and thank you, staff, for working on it. All right. Uh, next, we have the COVID report from James. Yeah, you know, I know it's late. It's past 1030. So I was just going to give a brief update. I'll give it under the city manager's update if, if that works for everybody. Okay. All right. Um, any council member reports? Um, just one thing is I hope that we, um, before we do everything we can, and it's, I know it's another burden on public works, but anything we can at before Ojai Ave gets all dug up for the CMWD program that we really make sure Grand is back in good shape all the striping in place, all the crosswalks properly marked, the, you know, the paving done up to spec final inspection, because that's going to be a major diversion route. And I, uh, I know we're, we're looking forward, I believe till October, but I just, I've heard from constituents with that concern that let's make sure Grand's in good shape before, uh, Ohio Ave gets all oh, torn out. Yes. I, I will add uh, in our discussion <laughs> last week, we mentioned the Sharrows on Grand. I drove on Grand. There's only one Sharrow that's still visible at this right. point, I think. Right. So when we do get that done, I think it is important. I can't remember. October is not that point. far away. I think we ought to, you know, we ought to make sure they're back or whatever we're going to do over there. Too. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I thought, I thought um, at the same time, we're doing the other stuff. Are you giving council direction right now? Is there I council mean, member the, reports. Are you giving the city manager direction for the sheriffs on Grand Avenue right now? Because do, I don't know. Do you think we should I, not paint them back on? I, I absolutely don't think they should. They're, they're all wrong. That, that needs a separate discussion. And this is where all new. The, the, the sheriffs on Grand is not on the agenda tonight, so that could be no. added as a future item. Yeah. Any other uh, council I was giving constituent feedback? In feedback. Any other uh, council member reports? We'll take the message of making sure Grand um, is, you know, is uh, usable before Ojai Avenue moves forward. So. Anybody else? I thought the paving work on Grand was exceptional. Ditto. No, I'm telling you from past repairs. Um, this Better. company, the Toro Company, did an excellent job. Yeah. Under. Um, the James and the public work work. Yeah, it's definitely better supervision. It, it's by far some of the best repair we've had 
in this community in a long time. I'm not giving them a free pass. I had a lot of complaints about a few things they did, but I will say uh, that that only took us eight years to do that. So at least we're seeing our money well spent out of the community facilities district. Yep. Yep. I just want to say thank you to staff for having such a great centennial birthday party on Thursday. Yes. Really fun. Uh, great for the community. I got Good a lot point. of positive feedback. So thank you for that. A lot of fun. I want to add just real quick. I think, uh, you know, I, I talked with James extensively and the cost for that was much significantly lower than I thought it was. I, uh, you know, I guess that's a future agenda item in some way, James, but I, yeah. I think we ought to consider uh, allocating money for it in the future to do it at least quarterly, if not uh, uh, more often than that. But once a quarter would be a roughly ten thousand dollars a year, which is not that exciting. I think it. I think it got a lot more value than that from uh, community input and impact. And it was it was not it was the worst time ever to hold it. In some ways, we got a lot of people there. It, I, I was well impressed. I, there was a lot more people and a lot more fun than I thought it was. So I get, well done. And uh, I would love to see us have a chance to bring that back and maybe make it something that we do not all the time, but sporadically enough through the year to make it happen some more. But, but change it to Friday afternoon and not compete with farmer's market. Yeah, that's that, that yeah. we realized that as although this one was on the 100th anniversary, but oh yeah, uh, we had future, to future ones for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, I thought uh, Bill Weirich's editorial was terrific. We should all read it and thank him for it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right, city manager's report. Yeah, I'll quickly uh, note that I uh, our plan is on August 24th that we will have an item um, to kind of be an update on the, the water uh, litigation and, and that process as it plays out. So tying into that editorial. Um, and then we have a couple items to bring back from today. Uh, but um, I know we skipped the COVID update. So just a couple quick things on our points related to that. Uh, we do have COVID testing Wednesdays and Fridays now. We, we were able to add Fridays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Sarzoti Park. Uh, I think people are aware, but we are going through a surge across the uh, county, state, and, and really across the country. Um, and so we're seeing an uptick for us in, in the number of people that are going and getting tested. Those numbers had dropped to maybe 20 people a week getting tested in Ohio, and those numbers are back up to probably about uh, 75 or so a day uh, across each of those. So um, we're able to get uh, testing Wednesdays and Fridays from 9 to 3 at Cerzoti. So anybody who um, wants to get tested locally can do so on those days. Uh, there is a um, uh, pre-registration recommended at covidclinic.org backslash Sarzoti Park. Uh, and then uh, just as an update, because we're getting a lot of questions about it right now, uh, the county uh, county's public health team is urging Ventura County residents that are eligible to get vaccinated as soon as possible. They are also uh, strongly recommending mask wearing indoors. But neither of those, we're getting a lot of questions about if there's mandates on either of those. There's not uh, mandates, but the, the strong recommendation and the urging to do so. Uh, we are in the midst of a surge where we're, um, uh, we're at about, uh, I think we had something like 530 cases yesterday or um, over the last couple of days reported in the county. In our zip code, the 93023 zip code, we had, uh, we're seeing an increase to about um, I think it was 24 cases over the last 14 days, which is in you know uh, a couple a day, but that is a, an increase from at one point we were uh, or just a couple weeks ago we were at 14 cases over 14 days, so that that number has gone up too. So uh, the the general message is where we are facing the surge, and we're uh, recommending that everybody uh, be careful and keep continuing to follow best practices and get tested at Sarzoti on Wednesdays or Fridays if you if you have think you have symptoms. So uh, with that, that's the city manager's update. Thank you, James. Any future agenda items? We have a pretty stacked agenda. Yeah, we have a pretty, pretty full one next week. Um, or in two weeks, we have uh, the uh, water litigation update. And um, 
of course my uh, file closed right as I was pulling it up, but we have the the um, water litigation update. We have uh, the League of California Cities Conference uh, delegate selection. Uh, we have, um, uh, we are planning to bring an item to discuss, uh, to start the discussion on CEQA local guidelines. And then also I believe that the date is when the, um, the earth friendly management policy is, uh, has been requested to come back as well. So between those items we'll have, and the, and the tiny home second reading coming back with some discussion, we'll have a full agenda. So. And, and also the additions to the fire plan. Right. Right. Okay, well, on that, um, thanks for hanging out there, Wayne. You win. <laughs> All right, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. Who is that?